Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. I am Lisa Gar, and it is such a joy to be with you tonight. Question for you. Have you ever had a psychic reading or any type of reading? And maybe you didn't like the outcome. Maybe you thought it was daunting and you wondered, how can I reverse this? Maybe you've looked at an astrological forecast and thought, what can I do? Is there anything I can do to change that? Well, my guest tonight, Colette Baron reed she is the amazing author of 14 best-selling Oracle card decks and five books with over 30 years of experience. And she has done tens of thousands of readings for people all over the world. And you know what she says? She said, I've seen many predictions come true, but others can change due to free will. So Colette is going to be joining us. She is, by the way, a literal rock star. (laughs) I love her so much. She's so great. In a former life, she was actually an EMI recording artist, an ex-Harley mama. She's been living, living clean and sober for the last 37 years and pretty much is such a fun person, has seen it all, and she frequently speaks with dead people. So we're going to talk about that. There was a whole TV series done about that. We will be back with Oracle expert Colette baron reed right after the break. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Have you ever had a reading from an Oracle expert? Well, joining me tonight is Colette baron reed and she is an internationally acclaimed Oracle expert, spiritual intuitive, a personal transformation thought leader. She has a wonderful podcast called Inside the Wooniverse. The Wooniverse. Welcome, Colette. How are you? <laughs> oh, my God. Only for you would I stay up. At, I'm, I'm on the East Coast, and it's 1 o'clock in the morning, and I don't think I've stayed up to 1 o'clock in the morning, and I can't remember. <laughs> the, the, what you told me, though, is that you haven't gone to sleep yet. So. No. I know. I've had so much coffee. (laughs) Cheers. Me too. Bring it Bring it on. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good thing. Well, I mean, lots to talk about tonight. And I'd love it if people could just get to know a little bit about you first, your story. You don't just fall out of bed and start reading Oracle cards, right? No, I know. I know I don't, (laughs) or I didn't. And I've got, um, well, it's a good thing we have two hours because I have a lot of stories. (laughs) Good. Yes. Yes. So, um... I don't know. You know, people always ask me that, like, how did I get into it? And I always, I always get a kick out of telling the story because I, I didn't want to do this. Like, I was hardcore into the music business. I was not interested. I mean, I, mean, I could do this since I was a kid. But it really was perplexing more than anything else. I mean, and made me feel really different and, and, and un, unreliable. I guess, I guess that's the other thing. Like, my feelings, because I could see things that were apparently not there or... Like, even things like auras, you know, um, mm. we went to church. Uh, my mom, we, our, our parents raised us as Anglicans, so we went, you know, that's like a church with that. It's like Catholics without a pope. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, Henry VIII's church in, in Canada, right? So, so anyhow, so I would go there, and I would kind of, like, notice that everybody had, like, this kind of, you know, colorful... Um, shimmering light around them. And then I'd look up there, and there was the stained glass, and there was the lights around the saints. So I thought that meant that every person was holy. Oh. I had no idea that, that I, other people didn't see that. I, we were just all walking around. This, like, uh, So even today, too, when I have to ask my husband, do you see that on the road? <laughs> wow, interesting. I can't draw. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you see it's, the difference between lightness and darkness around people? I actually can. And... It's really subtle. Um, it was different when I was a kid. It wasn't subtle when I was a kid. Mm. It, as I grew older, and I do think that little kids can see everything, and, and they're, like, super tuned in. But as I, as I got older and started to see the world through the lens that I was trying, you know, people were conditioned me to see, um, now it's more subtle. I can sense it, and I do get glimpses. Um, if it's late at night, like now, <laughs> hence why I usually go to bed early, um, I tend to be hypersensitive to energy and, and, and whatever. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I can see it out of my eye. I, mean, I can see it. In my, some of my workshops, just for fun, I show people how to see that. I can show people how to see, uh, you know, energy around a body. It's just a matter of soft focus. And, and to not, it's kind of like, don't stare at the thing you're supposed to stare at, right? It's like, just allow your, your eyes to soften it. Everybody can see this, but I saw it all the time. So things like that, the nightmares I had when I was a little kid. My mom, as I told you, like my parents were immigrants. My mom came from Berlin. Mm. 
she was Polish descent, um, and I found out later French. And my father was Serbian and uh, Mongolian, of all things. My great grandmother was Mongolian. She came over with uh, my 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 father's family was uh, they were horse traders in the 1800s, and somehow, uh, somehow this woman came along with the horses from Mongolia and became that part of our family. And used, my my dad said she used to spit at the back of the church. <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh yeah, she was a wildcat. It's what an ex- gorgeous. Of course, uh, you know, <laughs> of course, I, you know, right? yeah, yeah. But it runs in our family, all of this that I'm about to tell you. So, so um, I, I started having these nightmares when I was three, and they went for two solid years because I remember when they stopped was when I went to nursery school or to kindergarten, sorry, because I was in nursery school when the last ones happened. And they were consistent. They were always identical. I would see, like, a lineup of, like, skeletal-looking people with skin on the, you know, like, like really skinny, gaunt people, and a man at a table who was crying. And then there would be, on the left or right, depending on the dream, you know, there would be a pile of teeth. Now, I had already oh. lost some teeth because... I was at that age when the tooth fairy came, and I knew what that tooth looked like out of your mouth, right? So they were there. And then there was like a pile of gold. So, um, and then I smelt off, I I could smell things, and the smell would be the thing, the very acrid smell. Mm -hmm. And then I would wake up, and then I would go tell my mom, because I wanted to always, when I had a nightmare, I wanted to go to bed with my mom. I'd like, you know. Yeah. Anyway, but that was the only dream that I could tell my mother wanted nothing to do with me. And it, she would freeze up when I would tell her the dream. And so I associated there would be something wrong when I told her that, like, she wasn't going to help me out. Like, my mom was not going to coddle me or whatever. It would be like, there, there, go to bed. As opposed to, yes, you can come into my bed, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just tell you, fast forward. Uh, so this dream kept going, and, and I did feel like a real disconnection around my mom when I had that. And... Um, like I'll I'll be jumping around. We have plenty of time, obviously, yeah, so yeah. I don't have to rush the story. Mm. But uh, when I was older, I think I think well, I was 24, 25. My father lost all the family's money in a business deal. My mom had a bit too much to drink, mm. and uh, I had wears was wearing a cross that she had given me, and it was beautiful. And she said, "Take that off." And I said, "Why? You gave it to me." She goes, "Because you're a Jew." Oh, so I was. Oh yeah. So oh, like, my goodness. What? Oh, yeah. Listen to this. Wow. So you remember those dreams. Well, I knew nothing oh, my about goodness. my mother's. Yep. So my grandfather, uh, now this is a good story gets even more interesting. Wow. My grandfather, um, supposed grandfather, like so uh, actually was coming. My mother's mother was killed by a bomb, and he was part of the French resistance. She was born out of wedlock, was looked after by her grandparents, and then by this Christian family that worked for them that at, a, at an architect's office. Anyway, so he came from France to come. He found out where she was, came to the door. They told my mom to hide in the closet, and uh, they told she heard the whole thing. They told him she was dead, and then the SS picked him up at the door. Uh. Oh. So this is the man she believed was her dad. Now, my parents died in, uh, but anyway, so I, so this was, and then she, so that was the story. And my mother never told us anything about this, but I dreamt this, my, that, and anyway, so she goes, you know, those dreams you used to have, she says, I've known this, I've tried to keep this for you. I've tried to keep it away, keep it from you, um, you know. For your safety. For your, exactly, because my yes. mother was paranoid when she came here she and she completely reinvented herself and pretended to be somebody else basically oh, my dad didn't even know um wow. and yeah and but i knew because i kept dreaming about it and apparently they would take the teeth out of the you know the mouths of the of the um oh uh, for the, the gold and keep the gold and they would make jewelry for the ss officers wives Oh and girlfriend. Gosh. That's what they did with the gold. My mother knew this, and then she told me that's what those teeth were. I said, what do you mean? And then, of course, I was absolutely in shock. So uh, that was kind of insane and weird. But things like that, big things like that, like you couldn't kind of hide stuff from me. No. I, would, I just oh. know it. And that, so people treated me it wasn't fun. It wasn't like, oh boy, I woke up psychic. I was like bewitched. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> like, it was scary. I no, yeah, I had nobody to tell me it was okay. Mm-hmm. When my 
parents both died uh, shortly after my de- the big demise of the family. My father was quite well off. I mean, he came with nothing, and he built up a big land development business, etc. Um, and we went to private girls' school. And what, they, they were dying to make me normal, and that was just not uh, going to happen. Uh, good luck. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Well, for that. Yes. I feel so bad for my parents now. But anyway, they died quite tragically, both of them back to back after that. I had gotten clean and sober already at that point um, and uh, really kind of was really trying to turn my life over because I, I, I mean, I had so many things that happened prior to that. But um, I mean, it seems like a perfect recipe of not understanding the psychic awareness and having no support around that and seeing a lot of darkness and experiencing this very eclectic family background yeah yeah but i have some really great markers which makes it more confusing so (laughs) i had a babysitter when i was a little kid and uh, my parents would go out and we would have mrs kelly who would come to the house she was scottish in her early 80s and she was a psychic so she would (sighs) come as soon as my parents were gone her little old Little, little old friends would come over with the blue and purple hair. They'd sit around the table, and I would watch her do card readings. Oh. And, oh, yeah, and I saw her eyes would kind of phase out and whatever. Anyways, and, and, and I had started seeing things in the backyard, and I would tell her, and, and, and she was very strict. But I, one day she, um, oh, yeah, she was amazing. She was, like, really cool. But anyway, and very strict at the same time, made me eat. Her food was horrifying. Oh, my God, she was the worst cook on the planet. I had to eat it. Oh, my God. Anyway, <laughs> so, but, but she was day, good for I heard her boy. telling my mother in the kitchen, that I had the sight. Now, I know these days you're not supposed to do accents, so I won't do it, but so she had a very heavy Scottish brogue and was telling my mother that I had the sight. I thought it meant that I didn't need to wear glasses. My mother was very upset by the fact that I had this sight, that I wasn't understanding why can't, why why is this a problem? I, I, I won't have to wear glasses. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, I did yeah. not understand what not, she was trying oh, I to do. You know what I mean, right? Mm-hmm. So because I would tell Mrs. Kelly the things I saw, and she was, like, very interested in this and tried to tell my mom, like, you got somebody here with some some abilities. What are we going to do? So my dad, now here's, here's what's also interesting. I found out so much stuff about my dad after they died. So my father taught me how to read Turkish coffee cups. Oh. I was young. Yeah, so it wasn't all like I didn't have anybody or whatever, but I wasn't allowed to do it. It was the difference of knowing about it and the fact that my father could do it, but apparently he was forbidden to do it by my mother. Um, But when I was, oh gosh, 12 or 13, um, my dad taught me um, about uh, spirit animals, uh, which was very much steeped in uh, Serbian, uh, Slavic folklore, is very similar actually to um, a North American uh, um, uh, indigenous <laughs> folklore uh, and traditions. It's very, very similar. So, But I didn't even know that that existed at the time. All I knew is that my dad taught me this. So he taught me all about animism, about how there was a spirit in all things. So he was a deeply... It was a very confusing thing. He taught me about aliens. He taught like that was part of our curriculum. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Eric von Daniken, read Turkish coffee cups. <sighs> so I had but you be a lawyer. That was that was the message. <laughs> no, no, seriously. They 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 had prepped me for law school from the time I was born. Literally. Like that's what I was gonna do. Now I had no say in it. None. Did you have any interest in it whatsoever? No, 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 no. Right. No, no. I wanted to be a singer. I, I wanted to, mm. no, no, no. I wanted a guitar and I wanted to play music and 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 my dad made me go to Mr. Quinka. <laughs> oh goodness! <laughs> hit my hands on this stupid guitar. But anyway, that's another story. No, I, I no, no, no. This was an education was everything. You were going to assimilate into Canadian society, although the geography teacher told me to my face that we weren't really Canadians because my parents were immigrants. So, and plus, we were the only, I think at the early days of this particular private girls' school, we were some of the only ethnics that they'd accepted into the school. And the only reason why is because my dad had a title. Mm. He was titled back when King Peter was alive in Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia. My dad was born in 1908, so his family had, which really meant, like it sounded fancy, like Baron, sounded really fancy. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But to the British, right, because they were, you know, Canadian, you know, the Brits that 
colonizers were like, oh, wow, a title, you can come. Meanwhile, I think it only meant that we had extra cows and pigs and you could pee off the side of the mountainside. <laughs> well, be, yeah, I mean, what an eclectic background that you have. And it's yeah. amazing that, of course, you. it's the best thing that you didn't go after this traditional, you know, lawyer and... Oh, I went to law school. Oh, you did? Oh, hell yeah. I, oh, sorry. Am I allowed to say those words? This is like uh, on the radio. Oh, I we're, No, we are uh, pretty much beholden to no swearing on this station. Yes, I will not swear. Okay. I apologize. I apologize. Yes. I keep thinking I'm on like HBO. Or we're not <laughs> podcasting. We are deaf right. We are doing no, live radio. We with... have to be very nice. Okay, good. Yes. And it's, okay. I'll FCC is careful. listening. Mystical pirate is not allowed to speak. Okay. Correct. So, um, <laughs> yes. I went to law school, and, uh, it, and, it, and I actually did well in school, but, you know, I, I won't go into too much detail, uh, just in case people have trauma responses in the middle of the night and it would screw them up, but I had a very violent experience that happened to me while I was at university, and uh, it marked a, a huge change in my life. Um, and it, and I really think that that's another reason why I ended up getting really heavily into drugs and alcohol mm. because of this violent thing that happened. To numb the experience. And it also gave me a greater access to this ability. Now, I, I typically don't call this psychic ability, and I'll tell you why. I think when somebody says the word psychic, it presents a question that some people are and some people aren't. Because that right away you think of, oh, that person's psychic or that person isn't. But we all have intuition. In the, so the phenomena of, of really advanced ability of intuition is just like the difference between that everybody can run, but not everybody runs in the Olympics. Hmm. Right? Like some of us have a greater capacity for certain things and, and not others. Like some people are amazing at math. I'm just amazing at tuning into things that I shouldn't know or that I don't have any pre- previous knowledge. And that's another reason why I got so obsessed about... Divin- Sorry, my dog is snoring. Ah, <laughs> is a baby a- zoo. Mommy loves you. So this... Yeah, wait, you ahead. talked about the difference between being psychic and... and intuitive. Why yes. I like the language better. So the minute you say the word psychic to somebody... Well, mind you, on your show, it's the middle of the night. I think people kind of like the... They're, they're cool with it. But I think it, they're, it's a differentiator... And uh, and implies some type of power, supernatural power. Where I don't believe in that. I believe that the supernatural is natural, and that it's just that we don't understand it. We don't understand how some of us have greater access to it. Um, I'm not trained in any way. I was born like this, um, and uh, and it was emotionally very scarring or whatever. But anyway, so the reason I say I say the word intuitive. I'll even call myself an intuitive strategist and spiritual intuitive just because I, I want to level the playing field because I can teach people how to tune in and amazingly to be able to see the synchronicities in the world, um, mm-hmm. which are, comes easily to me because that's – and that's why it's become my life. But you're but saying everyone can do everybody this. Everybody has it. Everyone can develop their intuitive skills. and It's just like a muscle. You, The Absolutely. more you work with it, the more you – Get it developed. Hundred percent, and uh, and you want to know what uh, everybody can have uh, uh, an extraordinary experience that you would uh, that you would normally call a psychic experience. Um, everybody can have that, and likely everybody has and will, but they're conditioned to second guess it or to throw it away because of the way our culture has, has evolved over the past couple thousand years, actually. And yeah, to that's kind of deep it, programming, you know, too. It out of us. Right. And it's, you know what, sometimes I notice recently, the more I try to turn into my intuition, it gets blocked. Like, yeah, well, you explain, that's because you're not supposed to tune into it. You're supposed to allow it and listen. listen. It's a deep uh, listening. It's if you listen closely to the world without listening. So it's peripheral. So it's just kind of you you loosely tune in, and then the messages you can and then like it, there are epiphanies that come through, and you just know the right answer. Um, it's but when you look, it's like trying to stare at something. It it goes away, like it runs away. It's like it's like trying to chase a butterfly. So right. you have to learn how to be just super receptive without wanting it. 
If there, and, and this is something that I spend a lot of time talking about in my membership site, for example, and in my other you know, school and whatever. It's, it's getting people on, to understand that this is not something to chase. This is something to allow. And if we listen without our ears, we listen with our – it's a different sense. And you know you have it because you've done it before, and it feels like, oh, I get it. And there are methods that you can – um, learn and to understand how the world works as a as an oracle. Like we are constantly surrounded by information that that is available to us, but we discount it because oh, that's just a hunch or oh, right. that can't be right. right. Oh, that little mess m- image I had in my head, you know. But but yet you turned right when the GPS told you to go straight, and you avoided a bad accident. And sometimes you never even know that stuff until in hindsight, and that's how you learn how to listen to it. You go back to that hunch. Whoa, we are going to be right back have, um, in just a second. This is Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I'm Lisa Gar. My guest is Colette Baron reed And for 30 years, she has been doing Oracle card readings and spoken on stages all over the world. And her, what is your most recent Oracle card deck? Oh, it's coming out in March, and, and that's a great story because um, there's a Sasquatch in it. <laughs> Ooh, fun. So, yeah, that's coming out um, in a – what, is this the end of January? Yes. So that will be coming out in a month and a bit. Um, it is a phenomenal it's – a, it's a very, very different uh, oracle than I've done in the past, especially the direction of the art because I went uh, – um, up until now, for the past, I, I have 14 decks or 15 decks, um, and uh, uh, 13 wow. of them I did with the same artist, a fabulous, fabulous digital artist. But I had these visions uh, of these kind of alien beings that, let, like, I kept having these weird visions in these meditations of this kind of uh, cave art that was left by these kind of alien beings. And I, I kind of shrugged it off at first because every time I'm about, I'm about to create a new oracle, it, they feel very alive to me, so I, I pay attention. Mm-hmm. It is my most favorite thing to do, um, and uh, so I just sort of wait in between to see what's going to come up, and I just never know. And But this was very, very distinct, so that the the art had to be kind of a primitive folklore, folk folk art it wasn't going to work if I if we were going to do digital art, mm. and, um, and uh, which I'm kind of glad because all this AI hoopla and stuff like that right. on the art, I'm very I'm actually relieved. But I didn't mean I didn't do it for that. I mean, and plus my other artist had her own projects, and we're the best of friends, and it was time. Okay. So I had no idea where I'd find this artist. So I called a friend in Santa Fe, and I said, I'm really struggling. I do not know who's going to do this because I keep having these visions right of these like and again this is a this could be mythological this could be true because I really do believe that there are um you know beings that live in different dimensions there Mm -hmm. as opposed to like out there in interplanetary I think they're interdimensional and so I really saw these like really friendly beings so I just kind of went okay well who are you and again maybe this is my imagination it doesn't really matter because their symbols if so even at the end of the day that's what they were but they felt so alive so anyhow so she says to me i know exactly who you should call um this guy joel nakamura who's a brilliant he's quite a famous artist he, he's uh he's, he created a style he teaches at a few of prestigious art um art places too he created a style called neo primitive and uh, um, and he and he has a real he mixes traditions in folk art. He's Japanese American, really interesting man. Anyway, so I was like, well, are you sure he's going to work with me? And I don't think I can. I don't know. She goes, we well, got to ask him because just the other day he said I'd really love to make an oracle deck. Ah, just like right. Seriously. Of course. So of course. This was trippy. So um, he sees Sasquatch, like he has seen Sasquatch a couple times, oh. and this guy is not a liar. Okay, right. this guy. And he lives one. in New Mexico, right? Yeah, and I, I've seen all Very kinds common. of stuff there, too, but I've mm-hmm. never seen a Sasquatch. And they leave gifts. The Sasquatch leaves gifts 
my at my friend's house too. She's she's seen it, and it's and and when she feels it there, like she's a super incredible healer, um, Althea Gray. She can go. She goes into like these trances, and oh my god. Anyway, I've been to her house, and uh, I totally believe her. So she says she comes out, and then up up her stairs are like pine cones and little presents. Oh. So yeah. So he's. So when we were creating the art for the deck. I would have never put a Sasquatch in my deck, but we did it because it, we, the, the card again. is uh, yeah. when it, when you hear a Sasquatch sigh is the name of the card, um, and uh, and it is that when we forget our own magic, we forget that we're all capable of tuning in and connecting, mm-hmm. and that we just we're we're so. Our magic has been so conditioned out of us, we can't see anymore. We can't, you know, like so many people have been taught this is bad, this is wrong, this is evil, this is Satan. You know what I mean? This is somehow, or you're making it up or whatever, when right. this is very real, very, very real. So I didn't doubt him, especially since I got to know him, and he's he, this man has absolute integrity. and would he, he, You couldn't make him lie. That's kind of what Oracle cards serve, is because they help with that as a tool, a vehicle to access the divine or access your intuition or access these other realms. They're a yeah, tool, right? Exactly. They've been around for a very, very long time, right? Well, I became, I'm a total nerd, so I became really interested because, first of all, I'd seen Mrs. Kelly read playing cards. Uh-huh. Then I got in, I got my first tarot deck when I was 17. My dad had taught me how to read Turkish coffee cups. I knew I could see things, but I was more interested in the tool. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, ancient runes, the symbols that we see in Mesopotamia. You have sigils. You have all kinds of things that um, also pre, even in the goddess culture, really when you first had language, because, you know, you were, you, they created... Um, a specific type of divinatory tools where they would know. And it was originally for the weather and, like, what's it going to be? And, you know, are are we going to have a good hunt? Mm. You know, like this, like, what could we see? It was, it was a way for them to symbolize their day-to-day experience and, and see that, ah, it's like looking in, in the stars, say, ah, when the stars are aligned this way, then this is what happens. So everything is co is a correlated. It's a co is a colliery, not, not causal. So I started really diving into some, you know, out, real out-of-print books and uh, to, so I could find something that brought them all together. What did they have in common? That right from the ancient Greeks, you know, mm-hmm. for 1,400 years, for example, they had, like, we, we experience this phenomena all the time now. Nobody talks it teaches us this in school or anything. Right. And meanwhile, there was a civilization for 1,400 years that was part of their day-to-day life where they would ask for a sign about what is in their highest good, and they would go to the market site. They, they would ask the god Apollo, because he was the god in their in their um, pantheon that looked after um, um, spiritual phenomena. Or, or again, we, we can use psychic phenomena. We're in the middle of the night, but they yeah. don't know what we're talking about here. Yes. Um, so... So um, you would go into the market square and you would just wait to see. Sometimes you got something else. If you heard somebody talking to someone else and their voices raised above the others, you paid attention. Yes, you would hear that. You would listen. And that message, it would answer your question and you would know it. So today, you know, we... Uh, you know, we listen to songs on the radio. One of my clients, I wrote about this in my book, Messages from Spirit, which was a really interesting story about the common Cledon. Um, you know, this woman was driving in a car, I'll give you the, the really short version, with her boyfriend. They they had trepidation about going on this trip. And uh, anyway, they turned the radio on, and there was uh, Carrie Underwood singing Jesus Take the Wheel. Uh-huh. And he didn't like that kind of music, so he kept changing. And she really paid attention because she noticed that Oh, there's something about this song. Anyway, he tried to change the channel. It was raining in this car, and uh, he leaned over, didn't, wasn't looking at the road, and, and went back to a different channel. Jesus, take the wheel. Okay. And a big tractor trailer came towards them, and they would have had a head-on collision. She took the wheel. She grabbed the wheel, um, and they they avoided the accident. I think he lost an eye. They didn't obviously didn't oh die, but they had a serious accident so anyway. So it was listening to the oracle of the song. Yeah, it, that's okay. a cleat on. So it's, oh. it, it that is a cleat on. Sometimes when you watch a movie and a, and a line is said in a movie, and it's like, oh my God, that's answering my question right now. This is what's going on in my life. So oracles have always been about. 
Um, people think it's just about predicting the future. It isn't. It's about reflecting uh, the dominant energy of your life in that moment mm. that will help you, you know, make a decision or understand something better, gain insight. Um, Does you know, everybody people, hear it differently? Oh, yeah. Of mm-hmm. course, because everybody, everybody's going to have their own unique way of tuning, of, mm-hmm. of listening. And again, it's about listening. And um, it's just how we listen. It's how we sense the world. I have when, your your wisdom um, of the realms deck, deck that I um, grabbed before I left. Hidden realms, okay. And um, the hidden realms, yep. And I was just playing with it, and this card fell out. Yeah. And it just and it was like, okay, I have to pay attention to this, and it's called the Lady of the Mirror. Right. So it's about self reflection, mm. um, also about judgment. So um, not to judge yourself, but it's 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 reflect depends on whether it's in the challenger position or the ally too. So there's a a level of self awareness that it's requiring of you when you see that card when it falls out of the deck. Yes, it was it was super clear the message. Does that make sense, right? Oh, it made so much sense about <laughs> there's like a message for me in an event that just happened, right. and don't judge the event. Just look at it for what it is. Right. And don't make it mean something. Like, what are you making it mean? That kind of thing. Right. Right. What's interesting about my oracle, so so I don't just create card decks for the sake of it or that they're pretty or they're they're a card you pick just for that moment. You get a nice little thing like an angel. Mine are made out of divination systems. So these are actually a hybrid of what I learned to create something what's called a lexicon. What was in, what what did the I Ching have in common with runes, which had in common with the tarot, which had in common with um, other, you know, more obscure divinatory uh, ways of looking? Like, uh, I was uh, fascinated with augury, which is about the study of bird formations. Oh. I studied uh, water divination, and all of it had something in common. So when you when when there were words involved, like the I Ching is one of the oldest known divination systems. It's it's called the Book of Change. So we are all stories in motion. There is no such thing as absolute determinism. Um, we are always changing. Mm. You can kind of see where you're likely going to head, where you're probable. And yes, I built a reputation on predictive accuracy. When people say, "Are you willing to do predictions?" I'm like, you know, it doesn't serve. I will give the, I will give the probabilities and the energy, but you know, then you take away that person's. Uh, that Very well. Pers- yeah, well, mm-hmm. they get lazy, and and no, it, it's well, you do. You it, it implies that you're taking away their free will, free will, because you can change things. You, you've, you, I always find that a reading, if it really pisses you off, or you're, if I'm allowed to say that word, I hope, um, or makes you angry because you didn't re- resonate, or because it told you something, you could ask yourself, well, what could I do to change that? If I'm heading in that direction, hmm, yeah. I I don't want that 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 and that that on you yeah you know i wanted to make that change what would i need to do in order to become the person to have a different outcome so you can do that unless it is in your favor because i had this great um i guess alignment of the stars that i had put in my calendar because i read it and it said the 24th of january is supposed to be a banner day for you and so i had put that in my calendar and i looked for the things that were supposed to happen that day and i got a big great great contract that day and i'm like wow I'm like, there it is. It's right there because I was looking for it. But in this case, if somebody gives you something that doesn't sound good to you, you have that ability to change it if you if you want. Or like this card that I just got about the reflection and the uh-huh. non-judgment, I can look at that and say, okay, I need to look at the event that happened and say, this is happening for the highest good rather than trying to put all this meaning and judgment on it, like you were saying. Oh, yeah. So back to the question. So... On your deck now, the one that you've got that's coming out in March, are you able to pull a card maybe? I don't have that deck available yet. Which one are you Uh, looking at then? Which one do you have? You know what? The the deck I thought I would use is the one that I teach on. Like in case we, you know, after we talk or whatever, we'll do some readings. Um, So stay tuned, listeners. (laughs) Right. So (laughs) You can call and ask me a question. I will pull a card. I love it. So I'm using Wisdom of the Oracle. That one is called the Dreamweaver's Oracle, and I actually don't have a deck available because they didn't send me one yet. So I I can't use it because it doesn't exist. It's being printed in China. Not yet. Okay. But... 
So do this you... is the one that I teach with. This is the one that I would say is my most, um, well, it's, it's, I think we've sold almost a million copies of this, if not over worldwide. Wow. Um, and it is one I teach with, and it is the one that is based on, and, and the reason why I bring up the lexicon again is when the listeners hear this, because what makes my decks different is that they are created in as a divination system. Uh, with a built-in mechanism that I know they're going to work. Oh. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they they are going to accurately reflect something um, in your life that may be going on, maybe not with you, but with somebody close to you that you're being influenced by, etc. And it really gives you an, an opportunity to, you know, we're, we have so we're so powerless right now. You know, we've been fed this. I always believe we're, we have com- absolute power, but that's not what we're being fed by the media, et cetera. So I want people to get card decks and not have to call somebody like me. I want you to learn how to do it yourself mm-hmm. so you know how to make it so that you can be in the center of all this chaos and all this, uh, because really, there's ho- look, we're being fed hopelessness, if you will. Right. Uh, this gives you that hope. Let's be honest. What so- do you see as soon as you turn on the news? Oh, my God. And you so want to know much. what? These are all recycled old stories. Like, if you look back every 10 years, they're the same stories. Like, they're not, they haven't changed. Politics haven't changed. Like, the way we treat each other hasn't changed. You know, there's but a lot of things to. that haven't changed. But right. that means goodness is also just as available to us. So what are we going to focus on? And right. where, does, where does our attention go? Right. So the card deck is, like, as you said, it's full of divination, like the card that fell out right underneath me. Are yeah. you able to pull a card that could give us maybe a theme for what? I'll give you a theme. I'll give everybody a theme. I've already done this on my uh, YouTube channel, cool. um, but I, I'm going to do it again. So I, I, I'll tell you what I saw because I see things too, right? So and mm-hmm. and and then I I check in with some of my astrologer friends too to say, do you see what I see? Oh, good. Yeah. So I'm going to just give like we're already talking about the things that we know. So if you, I like to blend it with astrology. So astrology has already said by March, most of the planetary um, aspects that are impacting all of us have to do with technology. That's the big thing in March, March, April. Also, we go back to a more spiritual, something is going to happen where we band together with a more of a unified sense of spirituality, and I think morality. Um, we're, we're more polarized now than we ever have been. I, I'm in Canada, so it's not it's different than the UN, United States, but you don't have to be in the U.S. It's like everywhere in the world there is, there is strife, polarity, um, and it's part of this amazing period of time that we're in, which is like the, like, how do I put it? It's like before the birth is the pain, mm-hmm. right? We're, in, we're really in birth pains. Um, the cramps that the pregnant girl has before she, you know, right. can you imagine... This is, you know, if you've had, you've had a baby, so you know what it's like. You're really, really uncomfortable, and then, yes. you know, then all of a sudden you're screaming Best your head thing off, that and, happened. and yes. in, the, in such pain, and then out comes this beautiful baby, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where we're at. We're all in the birth canal, so there is going to be a huge, 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 huge uh, shift in the way. And I think because we were together just on a weekend, as we both know, yes. listening to that talk on AI, yes. there's going to be a lot of of hoopla around AI, its impact on our culture, how we have to meet it. It's not going away. It's going to be hugely impactful. It's going to be so fast we won't know what hit us. It's not going to be like when the Internet first came. It's going to be much quicker than that, and mm-hmm. it's going to hit us in a way that, you know, it's like it's going to change our lives. Some, some, some of it's going to change for the better. Other, it's going to, it's going to create a need for us to create new laws, all kinds of stuff. Good. I hope we can start flying over traffic. That would be. That would be great. Awesome. I think we will. I, I'm sure. I'm sure we will. But Please. just as a hum, as a humanity is changing, so you'll notice that our age. You know, I'm I'm older. I'm well, yeah, I'm much older than you too. I think I'm, I think I'm ten years older. I'm 64. So, um, wow. No, I didn't expect that at all. No, I thought you you were definitely not 64. I look amazing. Young. You I, sure I, I have do. Really good genes. Like yeah, you do. Mongolian cheeks. Am I? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you do. Yes. Oh yeah, I've got those big Slavic, you know, whatever cheeks. Um, but um, uh, so my generation, because I'm at the I'm almost a boomer, but not really. I'm in the next part. I'm, like, right on the cusp. So we aren't, like, our brains didn't develop uh, the no. same way that young people's brains did because we didn't. I, I, my career 
took off with no internet and no cell phones. People that is extraordinary. Phone that, number. Yes. I was telling people the first six years of doing readings, I don't really do this. I'm really a singer. Don't come back next year. And by the time six years happened, I had clients in 29 countries. Yep. All Pretty my, much your destiny. Absolutely. And because of, I now understand about the divination of the cards. All right. We're going to come back. Colette's going to pull a card for the a theme of 2023. And listen for it. We'll be back. This is Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast. Welcome AM. back to Coast to Coast AM. My guest is Colette Baron Reed, and she is the worldwide acclaimed oracle expert. She has been doing this for over 30 years with 14 best selling oracle card decks through Hay House Publishing. And it's really her greatest joy is doing this. She really has a it's it's part of your divine nature, isn't it, Colette, to want to do this? I mean, we were together about a week ago at a conference in Mexico, and you had your card deck with you and love giving information and questions and readings. So let's pull a 2023 yeah. theme card. Okay, so, so now I'm asking for what is in our highest good. So the whole point of divination means we ask divinity, we ask divine guidance that's always going to be in our highest good. And so it depends on the quality of the question that we're asking. We can't say, tell me about 2023, because it could tell you a million things about 2023. We know this climate changes. We know there's a lot of stuff. But I like to look for what what could we do, like, you know, what's reflected with the energy that is going to be there like it or not, that's just going to be there, like the revolutionary energy because of the planet Pluto coming in. And it's, you know, I think America's, you, you guys are in your uh, Pluto return, uh, 225 years, you know, it goes through the cycle. So this is like a big thing about the civic changes. How do, it, how do humans uh, serve humanity? That's going to be on tap. Hmm. And that is, it's going, that's just part of the theme of 2023. Oh, I love it. We're in a the, the, we're in a seven year, so I'll add numerology. So twenty twenty three adds up to seven, two and two and three. So we are looking at there's two twos, which is about communicating between like uh, groups. You have um, you have it's all about like relationships, like the relationship to each other, relationship to money, relationship to the environment, relationship to love. You know how do we treat each other? That's going to be really really important this year. And saying hard truths. Um, because the polarization has not worked. That's the other thing. So it's going to come to a crescendo this year, but we're used to it now. Honestly, we can't, we're so resilient. I mean, when you think about human beings, um, we are, we're resilient people. There are going to be some big things happen in 2023, mm -hmm. um, you know, just all, but also trusting that um, these are really to serve us. So whatever it is that we lose or let go of, it is really to serve the betterment of the full gamut of humanity. Um, and it's rocky. There's definitely, definitely need for uh, to be, there's a big Jupiter transit too um, in May um, that we have to really take a look at our tangible assets. Like how do we spend those? What do we do? So, so um, it's certainly not the same difficulties as we saw with the pandemic, which was very shocking. It's a different type of thing. Now we're like being shot out of a cannon is <laughs> pretty much in 2023. So it's great for creatives, really, really great for creatives um, and for people who really want to make changes. So I always, I learned early on, um, like, first of all, I'm coming from a, a, a place of that we are part of a quantum universe. We are part of that. That means that our intelligence, our consciousness is sits within the consciousness of others. So that's when I do the cards is for all of us. Like, what can we, what can we look forward to? And are there any challenges we need to know about yes. like at this moment on this phone call? Yeah. Take a look at right? that. Okay. Great. So, oh, this is so interesting. Oh boy. Okay. So okay. the first card I got was orphaned. Orphan. So, yeah. So the card orphaned Hmm. Is is a card when we feel like we don't know where we belong, mm -hmm. you know, and it's hurting us. It's really we're hurting. We're hurting. Um, there's so so much disparity. Uh, you know, where do we belong? Where do we fit in? And, and it's one of the reasons why we have these communities everywhere where you're seeing now, 
you know, all these like small communities coming together. You know, I see it in my world too. I have a membership site. I have all these different things, that, so people can come together and not and feel safe. So where is our safety? Where is our nurturing? So this is this is a way for us this year to really ask ourselves how have we contributed to. And again, a small world, because when you talk in big, large strokes, anybody could say that, like big generalities. But what I like to really look at, if a person is listening to the show right now or, or later on, what do they need to hear about this year? And it first addresses our deep-seated loneliness, um, you know, that, and, and to find new belonging. We're also exhausted, even though I, I'm sort of contradictory. I'm saying it's, you know, like, let's go, 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 because we do feel like we're being shot out of a cannon. But the energy also of this year began in Mercury retrograde at the beginning of the year. Oh, in yes. Okay, yes. so that set the tone of the year. Time for a nap is the name of one of the cards, and it's all about adding rest into your schedule. Huh. You cannot hustle the way you used to. Gone or the, And I'm actually going to be teaching a business class called The Spirit of Your Business. So I'm actually saying take the hustle out of your hustle and, and find out how to make your business sacred, especially for entrepreneurs. Mm. So this is really about asking ourselves to slow down, get off the Internet. It is frying your brain. And you're being influenced by the algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. You are not looking at uh, you are looking at what's being fed to you. Take off. Read a book. Phone a friend. Uh, take rest. Meditate. Our nervous systems are not equipped. They have to catch up. Like especially my generation, we're like we're. It's like we stuck our finger in a socket. Yes. Right. It, and it's TikTok brain too. I mean, nothing like lasts for longer than a thirty second attention span and a minute at the most. Yes, it's yeah. very reversing. So and you're right. We're constantly us. being fed propaganda, whether we know it or not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. And I'm. And I'm. Uh, so it, it's uh, it's requiring us the energy of 2023. Imagine that 2023 is a being like this world. This year has a spirit itself, and it's talking to us, and it's saying, "We need you. We need you to start belonging to each other again." You cannot wander around orphans, and it's looking at your phones, also wondering where is your connection. Uh, you know, find real, true connection, and you have to do it. It's not coming to your door knocking on it. Well, it could, but it's highly unlikely. You have to make an effort this year, like be good to your neighbor, do one kind thing a day. This sounds very like, oh, well, she could have said that, but seriously, that's what the card is saying. Mm. And we have to acknowledge that we are sad. I yes yes I agree. I mean, there's a lot a lot to be sad and to grieve about. Yeah, and from that we break our hearts open, Mm. so that there's more for us to give. Um, And also, the time to go card is 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 a card. And again, I made very modern sayings to these ancient symbols, right? Uh So I just like I just sort of said, well, what would it be in our world? What would that represent? So it's like you know. And anyway, so it's in the reversal which tells us where we have to know when we stay too long. Mm. We have to know when our old ideas don't work anymore. That's so, that is, we are going to be confronted with that in 2023. No question. Does, does, do your beliefs hold weight? You know, what do they mean now? Do they mean the same? And if not, get out of your comfort zone and literally be open to a new way of looking at things because the old way, if you cling on to the old way, you are going to be very, very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like let go the branch. When you think about that saying, you know, when, you know, kind of like the angel says, like, let go the branch, like, you know, like, don't, I'll catch you. I'll, you know, I, I will catch you. You just have to let go. You have to trust me. Um, and that there is so much going on in the collective that is very positive. It's like a net of awareness that's there to catch us. Because remember, we are made in the image of this conscious universe, this divinity. It exists in us. The blueprint for a better world is in every single one of us. What are we going to choose? And this is saying, you, if you cling on to your old ideas, if you are insistent on seeing things only one way and refusing to see, you know, from another point of view, etc., you will suffer. Things are going to implode. Yes, and I gonna, you will suffer individually, you will, we will, and we will suffer. And right. I know that to be true. And then to discern, the, the, the next card is called "Not for You." Um, I'm going to do seven cards, if that's okay. Oh, yes, for everybody. Yeah. 
Um, I'm on a roll now, and yeah. I'm awake, and I have another coffee. Yay, <laughs> me too. During okay. the break, I made more coffee. I will not sleep. Ooh. So Not For You is about asking ourselves also to be discerning and to say no more often. The only way we're going to make real change is if we say no and we don't acquiesce to the conditioned response in order for us not to be punished or the consequences that we're so afraid of by speaking up and, and speaking our truth. You know, it's there's it's it's already you know, there's this just we're already in a big hairball as it is. <laughs> right? Yes. So we're this far now. Understand that the the beauty of the word no, uh, uh, to so that the real, the right thing can be there for you. Don't take second best. Say I won't. I am going to wait for the divine to show me the true form of my intention, so that I can serve the whole. We're all here to contribute. That's the only thing we're here for is to contribute to the whole of humanity. Zip, not a nothing else. However, that is your unique way of doing it. You got to get back on track in 2023 because in 20. 24, that's when it starts to benefit people, even though there'll be a lot of chaos. So chaos is, is just there. Guys, we're in the center of a hurricane. Always, always. We're in the eye of the storm. Anything, but, I mean, worse than what we just saw with COVID and that chaos? No, it's a very different type of chaos. Oh, uh, you know, COVID made us see, I think COVID really made, made us look at our wounds. I, I honestly feel nature gave that to us to make us stop in our tracks so that we could start asking ourselves really important questions you know who are we to each other you know ha, you know are we really an inclusive society are we are we coming from the good of our hearts or are like the despair to be rich and poor or like the way we're doing whatever we're doing to the environment a lot of us you know it's like being hit with a mac truck mm-hmm. you know our own selves came to hit us like a mac truck right so it's like okay if we don't want this what do we want so this year is a really an important year to plant seeds and to plant the next card is building blocks it's about so we know what we don't want it's telling us very clearly we don't want to be in pain we don't want to be orphaned we want to find safe communities good groups find what is you know what's in service to the whole compassionate prosperity philanthropy that's going to be really important this year um, building blocks is about the foundation. We need a spiritual foundation. I believe that the cards are still reflecting that our biggest, dis- why the orphan card was first is that because we're orphans from spirit. We have, right. uh, I have nothing against religion. For those of you who are religious listening to this, please know I respect, respect, respect all the, the essence of all religions. But when they create more division between people, it's problematic. We just know this. Uh, the basis of all major religion is that God is love. We are love. We are made in love. We are made in the image of love. Therefore, we have to bring more of that. We have to ca- reduce the suffering of others in the world. That's really key. Now, the building blocks thing, thing here is it doesn't mean to burn your house down. Like, do you know what I mean? It's just not when they, when they say, let's dismantle the systems. Guess what? The systems are not going to get dismantled overnight. It's a lifetime thing. We have to stop trying mm. to scramble, like to be little good people and say, "Oh, it's all good now," and virtue signal and say, "I've done all this work." Right. This is no; it's a lifetime. We've got we inherited a house with a leaky roof and <laughs> a rotten foundation. Do we sit there and go, "We didn't make that. That's not our fault." No, no, you got to fix it. You got to fix it. Yes. Like I inherited that. Yes. Am I going to sit underneath with a bucket in my hand? No, I'm going to go figure a way how to fix the roof, get people together and say, I inherited this house. It's my responsibility. I don't care who did it. It's my responsibility now. So this year is also about responsibility. It's about being and learning. So it's a seven year, seven years all about learning. And my card here, uh-huh. the building blocks is about being open minded. Now I'm sure everybody who listens to your show is already open minded. And serendipity comes as a result of that. That's the last card. Serendipity is all this kind of we wonder where's all the good stuff? Well you're not looking at it. Like it's we see what we're fo- what we're focused on. We see and and then it's it's fed back to us. If our attention goes to something, we're gonna see more of that and that's that's how we're so mm. influenced by technology now that's going to get how do i i don't want to say worse because it's not going to be worse it's just going to be an explosion so uh, you know what i mean it's, a, it's going to be out of control in the beginning it just is yeah well that's interesting that's kind of what we're we're, we're in the middle of right now you know it's interesting because i love i was looking at your community the membership program that you mm-hmm. have the cbr love Dot com. Right. And it really offers a lot of solutions to what you just talked about. It, it's community. It gives you foresight. You do 
oracle readings with people. You teach them how to use the decks and really go them. And and you're right. And we play in there. And also, it's a safe place because we have a lot of we have a whole video too about um, you know, we have quite a few Christians that have come in that want to still do both. And we have a lady who, who teaches Bible study. She's one of my, uh, she runs the community with two other people. And she's like, we're, we have really beautiful open conversations about how there are different ways of connecting mm-hmm. to spirit, connecting to source to get good information. The cards are really good. They don't take away your free will. They help you make better decisions so you can contribute better to the world. You don't make mistakes the same way. You keep seeing the miracles. You know, the miracles are everywhere. It's it's how, look at your community. Your community is the same. You know, we focus on the miracles. You focus on the miracles. Right. I have 4,000 people in there. That's all they come for is I want to know, you know, they come. I want to be responsible, but I want spirit in my life, and I want to do it in a little weird way. Like, I would say that I've got the mystical misfits. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and nothing is off the table, and everybody is really respectful. We And we have a very diverse group of people in there. They feel safe. I make it so. Um, we can explore these really interesting, cool things. We have numerology in there. We have the monthly moon astrology. We I teach people how to work with the cycles of the moon, but getting back to our natural cycles, and then how to, you know, how not to get caught up in the big, you know, the big maelstrom of what's going on, but without denying the fact that we're in pain. So we do some shadow work in there too. Like when stuff comes up, we talk about it. So it's a, it's, and then, you know, we do something called spirit jam twice a month where I, I do do mediumship. I won't do it on the show tonight because it's too, it's in the middle of the night. And, and, uh, I typically am all over the place at night doing that. So I don't do it, but I do that twice a month. Um, you know, I do, I have that coaching. sounds like fun. Yeah. Oh no, it's, <laughs> you should come to one. Um, we have big crowd comes and one of the people picks them and everybody learns from the readings they are pretty profound. So, uh-huh. and this is that's the point. We can all learn from each other. So, we all need to stay open to the fact we are in this together. And serendipity comes when we do the work and we don't deny the fact we feel lost. Mm. We need a compass, we need navigation. I happen to have a woo woo version, you know what I mean, yeah. of this thing that's very modern and it's for us today. Um, and there's other things to do too. Like, I have my big vision board uh, event once right. a year. You, yeah, were you at that? or? Yes, yes. That was a lot. I mean, that was amazing. It was free and all at the beginning of the year and help people really break down the quadrants of the vision board. And I have friends well, show me their boards. Really cool. And the point of it was to really get people to understand that um, we have to evolve the way we see the mystical world, too. Like, I really mm-hmm. consider my work to bridge the mystical with the material. So materialism doesn't serve us anymore. But have, setting intentions to experience things, like, you know, maybe it is a new car, maybe it is this, but, you know, the whole, the, the, the why behind, the motive behind it, you know, like to really get that what you are doing and what you're trying to create in your life, you can do it, but you have to let the form come to you, and it becomes this incredible thing about self-actualization, which is really how do I be a better person? Right, which is going to make all of us a better person. Each better, person exactly. is focusing on how what they can do and what their part is. And even if it's just being kind to someone, it makes a difference because it has a ripple effect. And it's energy. Yeah, it's absolutely. Energy. It's all energy. And, and, you know, and now I think I'm, Lynn McTaggart actually just posted oh. a video. Yeah, she was just on my radio show, too. And she yes. posted a video today about the three scientists that got Nobel Prizes to actually prove that the quantum universe, that that the universe doesn't exist without our attention on it. Mm, so that beautiful. there's a cool relationship between how we create reality. And Oracle cards, like in the things I teach in my membership, is all about how, how do you get alignment. Our, our own reality, yeah. And that is perfect. So anyway, check that out on the break here, cbrlove.com. That's Colette Baron reed cbrlove.com. All right, we'll be right back, and we will be doing readings with Colette Will. I'm Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. My guest is Colette Baron reed She is the Oracle expert with the incredible 14 best-selling Oracle card decks. She also has a wonderful program, a membership program called, you can go to cbrlove.com and there you can get all sorts of great um, videos. There's a vision board challenge that she just did, the wisdom of the oracle revealed 
training series. So do people learn how to do how to do readings basically on the um, Okay, so they learn how to work with the cards for themselves, which is actually the hardest right. thing to do. So yes, right. they learn how to be how to see themselves reflected in the cards and how to explore this in a really safe and uh, really super friendly environment where there are no trolls, by the way. Um, And, uh, yeah, and they explore with other people that are there for the same interest. Um, And it's a way, it's a different type. In many respects, it's a way for them to feel connected to other people in community and bond together in a spiritual way. Um, I do meditations, and, uh, yeah, it's really, really cool. Right. Um, so well, if anybody's, like, interested in this kind of thing. And then we have, like, guest speakers in there, and we talk about things like aliens and, uh, fun um, yeah, like anything, you know, just, like, things that would interest people in our world. And I take a very... Um, you know, I'm super open-minded. I've had so many wild experiences in my right. life. I deny nobody any of it. So, right. but how do we use that? The whole idea is like, how can we use this information so that we could, you know, have better experiences in our lives, be happier people, right. um, you know, cause less harm in the world, and and add and contribute, and also to create our realities. Because I believe that with our attention, we create reality. With our attention, and, and it's yes. been proven now. Like the quantum physicists are saying, like, well, that's true. Well, there are a lot of people here that have a lot of questions for you, Colette. So let's go to the... I'm happy to talk to them. Oh, good. All right. Let's go to our Washington State caller, Pat. Pat. Pat, do you have a question for Colette? Hi, Pat. Do I? Pat, yes. Is this you, Pat, from Washington State? Yes. Hi. I have a question. Yeah. I'm 90 years old. I just had a stroke, and I was scammed by a scammer out of every penny I have. Oh. I actually fell in love with the guy, and now he never takes my calls anymore. I've lost everything. I can't pay my rent. Oh, that's know terrible. To, oh. I know it's terrible, and I don't know what to do. I have nothing, no hope, nothing to live for. I'm very, life is over. I don't know what to do. I feel hopeless. Well, well, first of all, it's natural that you would feel hopeless because something terrible did happen to you, but everybody has a purpose here. So um, the card that I, oh, the card that I got is Unfinished Symphony for you. Hmm. That means that this is, and by the way, you're, you're said you're 90, like you've got so much. I just so turned energy. 90. You're what? Just I just turned 90 in August. That's amazing. I know. So, okay, so I understand this is a terrible situation, totally. Um, your question is, what do you do? Because the, the answer is, like, is that what you're asking me? Like, what do I do next? Well, where can I find any hope? I feel devastated. I have nothing to live for. Of course. Well, you know, there is community. There's church. There's going, make sure that you don't go through this alone. The card that I got, like, other than telling you you need a big hug and I don't know what to say to you beyond that, the cards that I'm pulling, because that's what I'm doing right now, says it's Unfinished Symphony, that a lot of this story of your life, this isn't the first time that something happened where there was a devastating loss. Would you say that's true? Is that correct? Not, not like this. No, no, obviously not like this. Right. But you have been betrayed before. No, I can't. I might have been, but I can't think of anything right you might now. Have been. Okay, so so in order to maybe have this isn't finished. Again, I mean, maybe this isn't unfinished. Like no, maybe it's unfinished. Be the un- resolved. See, the unfinished symphony with higher power, which is God, which is about turning this over to God. It's it's it, but it's not done. It's a possibility you get this money back. Hmm. So that's where the unfinished business card says it's not complete, that the story that you're share, saying now isn't the end of the story. So um, Maybe that's and, your hope. Yeah, and that's the hope, exactly. Thank you, Lisa. You aren't kidding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, this, it could be that it, you recovered from this. Uh, you know. But the higher power card is the answer card, which is about getting getting back with God, recognizing that there's a spiritual value in all things, even though this is a devastating thing, the hope doesn't come from people. It comes from our connection to spirit. The fact that you could love at 90 again is so beautiful, by the way. I just think that's a very cool thing. So 
Absolutely. Pat, there's Wonderful. a there's a lot of hope there. There is sweetie. a lot of hope there. You you just just don't don't give up. I get it that you're feeling really terrible about all of this, but I really do. No, I can imagine, and I can imagine too that you're mad at yourself for having trusted this person. I feel so stupid. No, you're not stupid. Don't. There are con artists out there. You are not yeah. a stupid person. But I have a funny feeling that this could turn around. It's not done yet. There is more to come that will end up resolving this for you. It's Don't. Not, it's, you're in the middle of the story, not at the end. That's good news. Really? Don't yeah. lose faith let, in the hope, okay? Let's really? get somebody else. Yeah. All Thank right. You so let's much. see here. God bless you. Joe, we've got Joe oh, in Elkton, I know. Mm. And Elkton, Maryland. Hi, Joe. Do you have a question? I don't know where that came from because we had a, it's Idaho Oops. Falls, and that's that's okay. It doesn't matter. So oh, I, thank you, thank you for letting me um, for taking my call. So I actually I had time to think. I was in a really weird situation like 35 years ago, where my kids and I were abducted into a satanic cult. Okay. And I'm extremely I'm. Ex- Extremely spiritual, and it's taken me. I found out, I figured out there's some reason for that, but I'd like to have some answers for that. It is hard to hear you. Um, I don't understand the question. Yeah, I'm so. having a hard time. I was going to, did I call on a wild card line three, Joe from Maryland? That was what I was going for. I'm not quite sure that I don't know what person's name that was just talking. Sorry about that. That was confusing. All right, let me go. Let me, let me go to Joe on Wildcard Line Three. Okay, Joe. Okay. Yes, uh, Miss Lisa, Miss Colette. Hi. Okay, I got a Joe. Right? Are you Joe? Perfect. Yes. Sorry about the confusion there. Hi, Joe. Hi. Yeah, Miss Lisa, you are absolutely fantastic. You're my favorite co-host. Oh, thank you so oh, much, awesome. Joe. I'm glad you're here tonight. What's going on? And uh, Miss Colette, did you yes. say your father was Polish? My no, my mom was Polish, and okay. my my dad was Serbian when my and Mongolian. Like okay, yeah. well, okay. Did they ever tell you you have Slovenian blood? Slovenian, no. Um, and I've yeah, had my DNA well. done and everything, and I don't have that. I do have most of. So if you were to look at southern. Uh, Southern Europe, the South Balkans. Slovenia is part oh, okay. of the South Balkans. So, mm. yes, I put, I'm sure somewhere I might. But uh... mm. um, So do you have a question, Joe? Where the power from. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, I had a bad uh, little accident, and it robbed me of being able to walk. Mm-hmm. Well, mm. I, too, am a singer and songwriter. I've written about like 200 songs. That's cool. And I'm thinking about this year going to the studio, um, doing a few songs, and putting a couple out on video. Let me let me and, uh, just, let me jump in because I've got a couple of I, I just got a flash from you. So, okay. um, if you singing and writing music actually makes you want to walk, so it is the best medicine for you to actually do this. So you have to do this. There's also an opportunity with this. So in the next two and a half months is when you're going to do it. Is that correct? I'm thinking about it, yes. I think louder. Mm. <laughs> okay. Speak it. Think more. Speak do it more into the universe. Think about it. You absolutely have a very – it brings you peace. It's where you tell the truth. It's it, and music. It's, in your, it's never too late, and you're never too old. This is something that you have to do. You will need some help, but I think you might even end up raising some money. Like it could be that you put on um, – usually when I get that card, especially when somebody's looking at an artistic project, um, like a, I don't know, you, you raise money with friends and family or something to help you in the studio, but it does – it looks really beautiful. You have the card of peace and serendipity, that that's your passion and that's your destiny. I, you know what, Joe, you just said it to millions of people that you're going to sing. Yeah. So and we're all hearing you and cheering you on right now. You put it right out there for all of us to hear. So why don't you go for it? Mm-hmm. Why don't you do it? And then give us a call in a couple of weeks. I'm back on. So you can give me a call and let me know how it's going. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the reason that why you're so when I told you about this, about the cards we're saying. Go ahead. 
No, I'm saying, the reason why Miss Lisa is so fantastic because she gets fantastic guests. Aww. I do, anyway, I do. you better run. Well, you can't run. Like just wheel yourself over there. I'm telling you, you're going to do so well. And this is this is your medicine. You must do music. Ah, oh, beautiful. Oh, I love it, Joe. Yeah. All it's right. A voice, speaking voice too. Take that. Yes, you sure do. You sure do. Mm-hmm. All right, we're going to our next caller, and there's a couple of calls around finances. So I'm going to go to sure. Nancy in Pasadena, who's um, a question for you. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for calling Hi. in. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Yes, my question is about finances. Specifically what? Um, just how does this coming year look for me? Does it look like it's improving? So, okay. So so the best way to ask the question is what do I need to know about my finances for 2023, right? In other words, if there's anything unfinished from 2022, like what you could look forward to, et cetera. So let's take a look and see. And if there's anything you need okay. to clean up. Um, you also got unfinished symphony only in the protection position. So um, you are leaving a period of time. Not only was there financial difficulties, but there would have been financial misplacement. So, for example, it's like a loss of a job or a bad investment or lawsuits or things like that. Does that make any sense? Complete sense. Mm -hmm. Great. Good news. That's in the past. So you're still thinking about it, though. It's like you have trauma around your money story. Uh, does oh, that I do. When I say that to you, I do. Right. I want you to get a book by Ken Honda. He just published in America. It's called Happy Money, and he is a very famous uh, teacher in in Japan, and he's just published in English here. It's a fantastic book that will really help you because you are traumatized by this. So you're expecting. It's like you're expecting the other shoe to drop. Any minute now, it's going to be bad. And it isn't. Oh, yeah. like you have go the distance. It's like you just are haunted by all of this. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like oh, my God. Like what's, if is this going to happen again? Am I going to look forward to Like You're afraid. I get it. And so you have expectation that you're kind of sending a net out there. Remember when I said we create reality by what we put attention to? You need mm-hmm. to start paying attention to this in a different way. This is the past. Okay. This does not mean that it's going to continue in the future. Yes. Okay. At all. Perfect. Great. Wonderful. Great. Thank Wonderful. You. Thank you get so much for that. Happy Money by <laughs> Ken Honda. Uh-huh. Or come and join us at CBRlove.com. Yeah, I do. yeah. I, I talk about that kind of stuff in there all the time. Sounds like fun. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so could we go to Glenn in Nebraska? Glenn, how are you? <clears throat> uh, first of all, uh, uh, Lisa, very good music, bumper music. I appreciate Ooh, it. Ooh, yes, that's Michael Casio here with me in yeah. studio engineering. Yeah, thank you, Colette, for taking my call. My pleasure. Hey, uh, I've always uh, felt that... Uh, we in the universe are just one. We're all parts of one whole. Yep. And so we all interact with each other, whether we know it or not. Yep. And I've always wanted to uh, learn something like tarot cards. Sure. <clears throat> but, you know, I've never been able to find any with Braille on them. So my question is. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, you could you that? hire a uh, visually impaired person to put Braille on your cards? Oh, so I would I love could... that. I could. Yeah. Add, you know what? That's a really great idea. I could talk to my publisher about that. Ooh. That would be um, great. Really because good. I'd First really off, like to get into. This. I would love to ask my publisher about that. We we have closed captioning, etc. For um, we we've kind of covered everything, but that would be very interesting because we do have some people in my school that are visually impaired. Um, but we don't have Braille, not yet, but that's a great idea. That's See what great. you did? You started a wonderful thing here, Glenn. Thank you yeah. so much. Hey, I'm going to get on the phone. <laughs> Aww, that, and then let's give, um, see if you want to pull a card for... Yes, I would love to. Do, can, I, can you ask me a question that you'd like to know about besides that? Well, let's see. Uh, um, um, I don't know... What? Uh, what do I need to do about? Yeah, what, what do I, I need to do about, to do about uh, downsizing old stuff in my house? Great ah. question. <laughs> okay. so, Great question. So you got the card, clean it up. No way. Yes. <laughs> yes that's hysterical. Yeah, that's very funny. Um, but you also got stuck to it. There are two cards, which was a leg up, which is, we have, with that, 
that card came up earlier too. So that's about getting somebody to help you. You can't do this by yourself because you're just going to sit down and not do anything. You're going to look at it all and go like, oh my God, I'm going to sit down or yeah. something. So you need help to do this. The only way this is going to get done is if you get somebody to help you. Maybe I'll call on my son. I Aww. would do that. <laughs> Sounds I like a totally good idea. Yeah, you, you're a little bit of a squirrel, right? Like you like to kind of hold on to things just in case. I do. I, I hang on to things. Yeah, sure. too many things. Okay. I've got a big house. Yeah, and well, there's now too many things in the big house. (laughs) Time to lighten the load a little. (laughs) You want to know what? Can I say something else? You have the nicest energy. You're genuinely a happy person all around. Would you say that? I am. I'm always happy. Right? So So the card that, while while I was telling you about the other ones, was happy, happy. That's the card that is about a reflection of a happy heart, a grateful spirit. A great, you are okay. grateful to be here. Oh. And that's why you're going to live a long time and why people will come and help you because you have that, that energy. Okay. Wonderful. I, I agree. I agree. Okay. We have one time for one more wow. caller. And I, I know that this has gone by so fast. I and, know. My goodness. <laughs> we barely got scratching the surface. I know. Um, let's just go to Charlie in North Carolina. Charlie, thanks for staying up. Same East Coast uh, time zone there. <laughs> I know, yeah, we're on the East Coast. Yes. Uh, Lisa and Colette, I hope you ladies are having a wonderful night tonight. Uh, let's see, I've really got two questions, and I'm going to try to make them quick because I know you're running out of time. So, uh, one minute. First, one minute. Yep. So one question about myself. Uh, it's been a rough year last year, and it's like every time I get one step ahead, I get two steps back. That's right. You're it's like I'm running on quicksand. Okay. So it's tough for me to slow down because I'll sink. All right, wait. We're going to have her read that card real quick, and then we got to go. It's, it's part of the work. It's, it's, it's going to be like that probably till around June, and then after that, it's all the hard work you've put in is going to pay off. So just you're, 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 you're not you're sinking. Your ship is not sinking. Oh, that's you good just, news. Yeah. I've okay. heard that a lot about this. The June is things are going to get a lot better. But I also know you're wonderful, and your cards are incredible, and I love your energy. And, hey, we could do this another two hours, Colette. <laughs> Good. Not tonight. I mean, I could actually. Now I'm so awake. I don't even know. So how I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for doing this with me. Colette Baron Reed is my guest. Her oracle cards are amazing. They're on her website, which is cbrlove.com, is the membership site. Yeah, come and join it. Yes. You are amazing. Thank you Thank so you. much. I appreciate you. <laughs> talk. All right. We'll talk to you soon. We'll keep texting all night. All right, I will be right back right after this. Uh, this is Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast. Welcome AM. back to Coast to Coast AM. So the staff with the snake has been a longtime symbol of medicine and the medical profession, and it originates from the story of Asclepius, who was revered revered by the ancient Greeks as a god of healing, and some argue that this is where the origin of medicine came from. The ancient Greeks. Joining me is author and psychotherapist and educator and international activist and also a journey leader, Ed Tick, and he described the ancient healing techniques that we might have forgotten in modern medicine in his latest book called Soul Medicine. And he said it's really the one ingredient that's missing from contemporary health systems is our ancient techniques that have been forgotten, and they were the basis, maybe practiced for around 2,000 years. His book talks about healing through dream incubation, visuals, oracles, visions, oracles, and pilgrimages. We will be back with Ed Tick right after the break. I'm Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. So using both ancient wisdom and modern in-depth psychology along the stories of the healings for more than 25 years of guiding Greek pilgrimages. Ed Tick explores how we can really use ancient healing philosophies and practices to achieve and maybe combine with the healing practices of today in his new book, Soul Medicine. Welcome to the show, Ed. Thanks for joining me. Good morning, Lisa. Thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be back with you. Yes, you are in, where are you calling in from? What area? I'm I'm in central Massachusetts. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you for staying up late for us. And I was taken by your book because my father was in medicine for 40 years and and really one of the good doctors and, and loved the practice of speaking with people and spending time. But it's I watched him really get kind of swallowed up by the insurance issues. 
Where do you feel that we have lost our way in medicine, and where have we well, lost uh, the your origins? Well, anecdote is a great point because you've already introduced some of the ways that we've lost our way. You mm -hmm. said your father, as a physician, loves to sit and talk with people. Yes. So right there is a, uh, an example of where we've lost our way. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because you're right, the insurance companies, uh, the very severe strictures on modern medicine, um, also the dominance of the pharmaceutical industry, that we have uh, learned to translate everything into symptomatology that indicates an illness that uh, uh, usually we're uh, treated with medications. Uh, just to control the symptoms. So talking to people as your father did, treating people as whole pe beings who happen to have a, um, some issue of distress, not just treating the symptom or treating uh, the diagnosis. Uh, mm -hmm. These are uh, profound ways that we've re really lost our ways. But this goes far beyond um, even what we're sharing right now. Uh, going back to ancient medicine, uh, most people have heard of Hippocrates, who was called the father of modern medicine. He was the first scientific physician, um, and he represented the transformation of medicine from a holistic and spiritual enterprise that it had been for a thousand years, uh, transforming it into the scientific enterprise that we understand now. But Hippocrates comes from the spiritual tradition, and 2,500 years ago, he said, all illness begins in the soul and ends in the body. And that's, in essence, uh, what we've lost, that we don't look at the whole person. We don't look at the spiritual center of our beings. We don't ask how that has been impacted and how our stresses and illnesses are expressing themselves through the body. But it's really the soul, the spiritual center of our being that's trying to talk to us with the symptoms. So we don't know how to listen to our dreams. We don't know how to listen to, to translate the symptoms that our body is having into holistic or uh, psycho-spiritually-based conditions. We don't have uh, full holistic um, and ritual-based practices uh, for addressing them and healing them. All of this and more existed in the ancient Greek world, and we have lost it all. Why do you feel that we've lost it? Oh, there are so many reasons. Uh, mm. We have, um, for a short time in Western civilization, uh, the ancient Greek culture was beautifully balanced between the rational and the, the non-rational, the spiritual, between the logical and the intuitive, between the grounded and the, um, the universal, between um, what we can see and also believing that there is uh, an invisible world. When reason entered into Western civilization and we began to analyze and dissect and uh, apply re uh, logic and science to everything that we experience, uh, for 2,000 years, science and spirituality that used to be or that originally were united have been moving away from each other, and we've been uh, using our intellect to tear apart the pieces of our whole being and the pieces of, of our spirituality that used to be in balance. So, uh, so we have been traveling away from holism for 2,000 years as a civilization, and many practitioners today, uh, again, some, like some people that you interview, not just me, but talking about oracles, is trying to move back toward the holistic, the spiritual, the invisible, not to um, allow ourselves to be completely dominated by that, but rather to bring science and spirituality, reason and the imagination back into balance. So that is a very good point because science couldn't prove things like dream incubation, right? Because there were subjective experiences, right? Uh, yes, right. And that's a challenge we have in our modern era as well. We all hear about evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. It's good, it's necessary, it's important. However, evidence-based medicine is based on norms, based on statistics, based on studying thousands of people all at the same time. That excludes the individual's experience. 
experience is also evidence. Mm. Now, from the ancient world, we have, uh, from this tradition, the Asclepian healing tradition, we ha- actually have thousands of testimonies from the ancient world of the stories that people actually experience in these healing practices. What? That is also evidence. So that, yeah, it, it's, it's documented evidence. What exactly is dream incubation, and how long was it used in the, uh, in history? Okay, so we'll go back to, uh, with our friends, our listeners out there. We'll go back to the origins of medicine and psychology in the ancient world, uh, or and Western civilization in the ancient world. Okay, okay. so... Uh, what we call dream incubation, what the ancients called dream incubation, began uh, about uh, around 14 or 1500 BC in uh, Thessaly, in northern Greece. And it began in, uh, as far as we know, it began in caves uh, where people would go for, well, and a great analogy is Native American vision questing. People have right. um, compelling need. Uh, they're going to war. They're becoming adults. They have an illness. Uh, somebody in the family is dying. They need to talk to the spirit world. Some kind of compelling need that says, I need to go beyond the human to connect to the universal, the spiritual, in order to get help and guidance on healing. In the Native American tradition, people would prepare for a long time uh, with their, their teachers, their medicine people. The community would support them, and then they would go out into the wilderness for one, two, three, four days to be alone, fasting, praying, talking to the gods, to the the spiritual powers, talking to the universe, observing nature, and allowing whatever uh, dreams, visions, strange experiences come to them. And those are considered the answers from the spirit world or from nature. Now, Esclepian dream healing was similar in this way. People prepared for a long period of time. Uh, They had a compelling need that they could not uh, get help for in any other way. Uh, Basically, human intervention failed, and so they turned to spiritual sources, to the gods and goddesses, for help. Uh, And so in dream incubation, people would go to uh, holistic healing sanctuaries, and we have some today that are partially modeled on the ancient world. So if people go to... Excellent Institute or Omega Institute, hmm. where holistic practices are, are given and people are in retreat for a long time. That's part of what happened in the ancient world. People would go to holistic healing sanctuaries. We know of over 320 that were spread all over the Mediterranean world. And they would go into the sanctuary and stay for a long time. And that's where holistic practices were applied. So people got uh, acupressure, massage, color therapy, hydrotherapy, psychotherapy, astrology, gymnastics, nutrition, um, and theater. Uh, the origins of uh, tragic theater are also related to this uh, tradition. So, so in the we... sanctuaries, we haven't even gotten to the dream incubation yet. I'm right, sorry. right. <laughs> okay. So people would experience holistic healing practices that really bombarded them. They were drenched in this healing sanctuary. They could stay for as long as they needed, not like today where such sanctuaries, uh, retreats are very expensive, but they were free to everybody. You, uh, They were open to men and women, to emperors and slaves, everybody in between. People only paid when they left for the healing they received. They didn't pay on uh, coming in, and there were no upfront requirements for uh, <laughs> in your way. Mm -hmm. Now, back to, uh, so they'd be in the sanctuaries for as long as needed until they received some kind of dream or vision or message that it was time for this practice, dream incubation. And that's when they went into a special building. Uh, Originally, they went into caves in the mountains. Later on in the classical times, when the sanctuaries were fully developed, they went into a special building that was only reserved for nothing but dream incubation, and they would uh, lie. Well, they would lie on a couch called a clinicos. Our word clinic comes from this tradition, and they would stay in the incubation chamber for as long as it took, some hours or even days, for as long as it took, fasting, praying, 
sleeping and waiting for a dream or a vision that would come to them in which they would see some vision of the, the healing god of Sclepius or any of his uh, totem animals, um, especially the snake, but also the dog and the rooster, or some of his helpers. He had, in mythology, he had three daughters, and they were also all healers. So they also came in dreams and visions. So while people were incubating, uh, they waited and waited and waited until they received a big, a big what Carl Jung would call a big dream, mm-hmm. not an ordinary everyday dream like we all have uh, most nights that are about our personal lives, but a big dream, which is when we see or feel or experience something coming from the spiritual. And in the ancient tradition, uh, the dreams came in these forms uh, with these animals and these these, uh, divine figures that would come. And in the dream, they would actually bring a healing in the dream or they would tell, give a person a prescription for how they had to heal themselves. So they would bring so, information. You would have some type of epiphany and clarity. Does does this same thing happen for grief? Because I'm wondering how the ancient Greeks dealt with grief. Is it also, could it be in the form of like an incubator? Uh the ancient Greeks, they, uh, excuse me, they dealt with grief uh, in uh, ways that are, were much more uh, communal and supportive than we do. So, uh, yes, somebody can go into incubation and uh, deal with their grief and fall into very, very deep grief so that they're really cleansing their system. Um, Greece, the Greeks also had other ways. For example, tragic theater was a way of dealing with grief. Uh, the Three famous tra- playwrights that we know of who invented tragedy, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, uh, they were all combat veterans. And they were, uh, they invented tragedy and expanded tragedy out of original uh, spring rebirth rituals. And they wrote their tragedies uh, not exclusively, but largely about the experience of warfare. And in theater, um, Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people would come to the, the tragic theaters, and they would experience uh, that famous word catharsis that Aristotle gave us, which means the purging, the emptying, and cleansing of all of our negative emotions. So 10,000 people in the theater would be watching a play about the horrors of, of war together and all experiencing grief, mm. the collective grief that they carry, seeing it portrayed on the stage, and having a kind of a mass cathartic experience. So um, this is one way of dealing with grief, recognizing it exists collectively and communally, and giving people the dramatic portrayal of it on the stage so they could see and feel their own losses, um, their own stories portrayed for them, and share them with the entire community. So grief was not... uh, private matter as we keep it, but really uh, public matter uh, necessitating intensive healing rituals. So it wasn't to be dealt with alone, and there was a ceremonial aspect to it that helped the processing of the relief of grief. Fascinating. So I ask that just because it, you know, unresolved grief over long periods of time can also lead to illness, and it's part of the art form that has been lost in modern medicine and the scientific breakdown of things is that ability to listen to the situation or the circumstance or the scenario that might be impacting the cells on the body. And that has, as by far, the biggest thing that I got out of soul medicine is that that was really missing, or it really is missing in our modern medicine right now. What about psychology, though? Does psychology address that? Is it bridge the gap? Uh, psycho- modern psychology is also losing, has lost its way, and we need to help mm. bring it back as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you rightly mentioned the importance of listening. One of the titles that the healing god Asclepius was given was the listener. Oh. The listener. 
Um, uh, some psychology is differentiates and names the importance of deep listening. And uh, that is really, really putting aside our theories, putting aside our previous beliefs, actually putting aside our diagnostic system and listening very, very deeply to the individual and the story they're telling and how their distress comes out of the story. So I'll give a personal example uh, quickly. Uh, I had um, I have spinal stenosis. I was diagnosed with that about five years ago. Uh, I had have had many healing experiences with it, and uh, it's pretty healed uh, now. But one experience I want to share is that after I had MRIs and I was given the diagnosis, every single medical professional I went to just asked, "What is my diagnosis?" And they were giving me standardized answers for how to deal with it. Um, and for five years, I could not help find any medical help. Mm. Uh, it was always, and this is a, a medical system is dominated this way. They don't ask, nobody asked what led to my stenosis. Nobody said, oh, your spine is, is um, being crushed. Well, what are the burdens? What are the challenges in your life and that have been going on for a long time that has led to the compression and the crushing of your spine. Mm -hmm. What is it in your life that is contributing to this? Uh, just, oh, you have spinal stenosis? Well, we give um, cortisone shots and, and surgery. You want it? Uh, um, right. So, no, uh, that's most people's experience of Marta medicine these days. And I want to, I'm really interested in what the soul medicine approach would be. And we'll find out a little bit more when we come back with Ed Tick after the break. This is Lisa Gar. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. I am Lisa Gar, and my guest is Ed Tick, and he has a new book out called Soul Medicine, Healing Through Dream Incubation, Visions, Oracles, and Pilgrimages. And before the break, Ed, you were talking about the healing, uh, well, spinal stenosis and how a lot of the the diagnosis you were getting were to do the injections and various symptomatic effects did, how did you get to the base of the soul medicine part of it? Could you give us an example? Uh, sure. I can give uh, many. All right. So the one matter is what we were saying earlier, that we need our healers to listen deeply to us, to not just ask what our symptoms are and give automatic responses through um, surgeries or through medications. Here's a drug to take care of the symptom. Right. So we'll do when we wipe out the symptom, we're actually wiping out the messages that our souls are giving us, that our, our spiritual centers are giving us. Symptoms are symbols uh, from the, our center through our body trying to tell us what is going on, what's wrong when we haven't been listening or when for a long time our uh, lifestyles and practices have accumulated and we've ignored our true deep needs. So back to um, my spinal stenosis. As I shared, most medical professionals just listened to the symptom and wanted to give um, injections and surgery. And I refused that. Um, I refused that and, and kept looking for help and support. Mm -hmm. Only one physician in all of my searching said to me, uh, I don't want to hear the diagnosis. We don't even know if the diagnosis is right. Please sit down and tell me your experiences. So he wanted to hear how I'm experiencing the symptoms in my body. And, uh, and he also wanted to hear how long I've had them, how they are related to my life story, when did I first notice them, and how do I deal with the pressure and stress. So he was the only physician of five years of searching who did any deep listening to me. Mm. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I want to talk about how I learned about... Um, well, just real quick, did it help? Mm -hmm. It did? Was, th was well, that an effective result for you to have that? What was the result of the back? Uh, the result of that was for, uh, for me to say, oh, I actually don't have stenosis. Uh, he said that it, after years of searching and so many professionals saying, because... We looked at your um, MRI. That's what you had. No, actually, 
Um, I'd had spinal degeneration for decades, but it never broke down. And it, uh, what helped was, what are you experiencing? Why now in your life cycle right. it, has the pressure built up so much that you're registering this as a, a disability? And uh, what do you have to do with your life to lighten your burdens? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, uh, so the deep talking uh, affirmed that I was going in the right direction of looking at my whole being, not just treating the symptoms. I'm going to jump to something else, uh, the dream incubation. Yes. I did have dream incubations about this condition, uh, and uh, some extraordinary things happened that are almost unbelievable. Um, so as we said, dream incubation occurred when people remove themselves from the mainstream and when uh, on healing pilgrimages or to holistic health centers uh, and remove themselves fasted, prayed, focused on uh, whatever need is coming through their body and their their lives and asking for help from the divine. So I lead, as uh, we're sharing tonight, I lead healing journeys to Greece. I also lead healing journeys to Vietnam, and I've been working with our our veterans in these manners, holistic healing of post-traumatic stress disorder for decades. That is fascinating. I want to talk with you about that. Which... Yeah, we can, well, you can go there and we can yes. put them together. I'm going to share a dream incubation that I actually experienced in Vietnam about healing my spinal stenosis. Huh. Okay. okay. So this is uh, put all the, the world traditions together into their universal uh, uh, components and symbols. I had a group in Vietnam. We were in the Mekong Delta in a very remote area. We were staying uh, for several nights in actually in the little compound of a Viet Cong veteran who's become a friend and has helped us uh, help American veterans heal. So uh, he has a compound built uh, on stilts right above the Mekong River. I was sleeping on a cot there with my stenosis. Uh, I was having, I, that, it was bad that time. I was on crutches. Mm. I couldn't even uh, walk upright. Well, one night, sleeping on the on that river, uh, and hoping and praying for some relief from my pain and my struggles, uh, I had a dream that a giant snake, like a four foot long snake, came out of the river, climbed up the pilings, climbed up onto my cot, and bit me in, uh, sank its fangs right into my left thigh. And even right now, as I tell you that story, I can feel in my thigh where that dream snake bit me. Uh, So that's in the Asclepian tradition. I was asleep at night on retreat in a remote place. And a snake crawled up like a giant caduceus and wrapped around Mm -hmm. the pilings and Mm -hmm. climbed up uh, out of the river and up onto my cot and then bit me. What I experienced, as I shared, I was walking on crutches then. When I woke up that morning after that snake bite dream, I had no pain. I had no struggle. I didn't need the crutch. Or didn't need the crutches at all. I was dancing. Wow. I, I was climbing mountains again. I was dancing. I was dancing through the streets of Vietnam, singing, and <laughs> completely pain free. So uh, this is an example of a spontaneous dream incubation on issues I've been working on for years. While I was on a healing journey trying to help others, mm-hmm. and it came in this ancient Asclepian form that, of course, I immediately recognized because I've been working in this tradition. Right, right. What that an and me, it also taught me that my body can do this. That mm. yes, in fact, this is a holistic problem, not a physical deterioration. When uh, medical professionals have been told or telling me that I was chronically disabled and I'd probably end up in a wheelchair. But the dream showed me that, no, that's not the case. And I can somehow be in better balance uh, with my life, with my burdens, and I can learn to walk again um, and dance and climb mountains, which I now can do. And you still, that lasted for you. Um, that's incredible. It's five years later, and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, I can climb again. I can I can uh, hike and, and climb mountains again, and I have very little pain. I do have uh, 
I'm not saying that uh, that we don't also have physiological conditions and challenges. From right. It. I do have neuropathy in my feet, mm-hmm. so I have reminders that my body was afflicted and changes have happened in my body. But beyond that, I don't have issues, and I'm very happy and and uh, and doing well. Well, and that also. It has to do with the Vietnam and the trips. Were you in the Vietnam War? Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, I'm that age. I'm 71. I So I was in college during the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. and I was protesting it uh, quite passionately. I wasn't, I wasn't a leader. I was on the front lines of the protest movement. And um, now you and- bring groups there to cause healing, right, to, that are— really struggling yeah. with PTSD from that war, right? Oh, yes. I've been, um, I, we can connect these, uh, the Greek and the Vietnamese wars and traditions as well, um, if we can go in that direction. Uh, but yes, uh, I've been working with our veterans from Vietnam um, since the late 1970s, before post-traumatic stress disorder was even a diagnosis. Wow. I'll, uh, I'll put this together with our Greek studies. Uh, because it's really fascinating. So I worked, um, I began in the mid to late 1970s. I was working as a psychotherapist with our veterans for about eight or 10 years. I realized that as uh, the problems of post-traumatic stress disorder are so deep, so comprehensive, that ordinary talk therapy was not going to be enough to heal them. Right. Uh, I went to Greece, actually, this is way back, 1987, after about a decade of work with our veterans, I went to Greece to study the ancient citizen warrior tradition there. Uh, warfare was so endemic to their culture that I uh, assumed that, and to world history, that I uh, assumed that other cultures from other times and places must have had comprehensive ways for bringing their veterans home and healing the wound we call PTSD. Mm. Well, in my lifelong uh, work in these traditions, I've learned that what the wound we call PTSD has been part of civilization and part of uh, violence and warfare forever. Um, The word trauma itself comes from ancient Greek. It is an ancient Greek word that meant a stabbing or a a piercing wound, like from a spear or an arrow uh, or a sword. Uh, But to the ancient people, the piercing was to the soul as well as to the body. Uh, Everything, when we are wounded, when we are violated, the, the origin of the word violence violates our being. Every part of us is wounded, not just our body, but our minds, our hearts, our souls as well. So I was going to Greece to study this. I went to, um, well, it's a place called the Epidaurus, uh, Epidaurus uh, in the English spelling, uh, and it was the principal healing sanctuary of the ancient world. Mm. I didn't know that at the time. I went to see ancient theater. It has a huge 14,000-seat theater in the ancient world that's still used every summer for uh, for um, ancient theater festivals. Uh-huh. The night I went, the play The Trojan Women was in performance. The Trojan Women was by Euripides, Euripides had been a general in the Athenian army. He wrote this play to protest what the Athenians were doing during the Peloponnesian War. He was actually protesting atrocities that the army was uh, was committing, even though he had been a general and very devoted to, to his people and his service. All right, so I saw that play in the ancient sanctuary. Yes. Uh, and at night, uh, by torchlight, Nothing uh, wow. was really per- performed in the ancient way. It was extraordinary. Nice, yes. Uh, during that play, the that play demonstrates all of the wounds of war. Mm. It happened to, after the Trojan War when the Greeks have defeated the Trojans and they're sacking the city. They're taking all the women away as prisoners and as slaves. They've killed all the men. They're killing off the children. So we see all of the horrors of war portrayed on the stage in the most intense, dramatic form with very, very moving poetry. I experienced, we used the word catharsis earlier, I experienced catharsis in that play. Uh, The word anathema 
It's also ancient Greek. And the queen of Troy was screaming from the core of her being, anathema, anathema, anathema. War is anathema. It's against the theme, against the way, against the order of life. Right. It's destructive and reverses everything. Well, uh, it's hard to describe what I experienced in the theater that night, but it changed my life. I went to that play as a healer for Vietnam veterans. I realized through that play that all wars from all times and all places are the same. Mm. It's not primarily about politics or economics in the moment. It's about the horrors uh, that, that we do to life and how we turn our creative energies, our resources, each other against the life force itself. And anathema is the soul wound that anybody feels coming out of war. I'd gone into the theater thinking of myself as a psychotherapist for Vietnam veterans. I came out of the theater saying, no, um, I'm called to address and heal um, violent trauma anytime, in any way, in whatever form it comes. Mm. And all wars and acts of violence are essentially the same. They're archetypal. They recur again and again, and they have the same themes um, throughout history. And so I'm called to address and heal all of this. And that cathartic experience I had changed my attitudes and my values and my understanding uh, of warfare and the human relationship to it forever. And it also taught me uh, what theater can do that uh, as yes. an intense healing experience. And it also propelled me, uh, as I said, it, the theater was at the principal healing sanctuary. And so I said, I don't know anything about this healing tradition, and I don't know why theaters are here, so I need to research this. And that's when I began researching and using the Escapian tradition and uh -huh. applying it um, to everybody's healing needs. The theater essentially is just like the dream incubation because it's a dark space and it gives these images that are supplied for you. But if you go deep enough into it, you could get your own healing as you just did, as you just described. Exactly. And that's what you do with story as well. Mm. Encourage people to tell their stories as fully, as symbolically, as emotionally as they possibly can. Yes. And that itself, uh, they put their story together, the different puzzle pieces of their lives, mm -hmm. and they achieve um, healing through catharsis of the varied emotions and through the expression, and through making it public, through sharing, not just keeping the stories locked up in, inside yes, us. That's so exactly that's what I teach, theater. yes. And yeah. that's what theater does for us. Yes, it does. Yeah. This is so fascinating because, I mean, I will, just coincidentally, my father's not only a doctor, but he was also a Vietnam vet, and he also had these experiences of PTSD, regardless of his uh, ability to heal it. And went through the typical neuropathy of the Vietnam uh, tragedy because of Agent Orange. And I know that there had to have been just as much damage that was done to the Viet Vietnamese people and their land by killing all the, the foliage and the forestry and the people and the devastation that happened there. It is a universal theme. As you mentioned, war is harm to all humanity in that case. And um, it was, that's an incredible humanitarian perspective that you saw and that you take people there. Is your story continuing to play itself out over and over again? And that's a perfect example of how story heals. Uh, yes, thank you for that. And um, we could talk uh, for hours about the <laughs> Vietnamese experience and bringing people there as well. But let me just briefly say, uh, we could go into this. Uh, while post-traumatic stress disorder is epidemic here among our veterans, not just Vietnam, but mm -hmm. all the wars that we've been fighting and also throughout our culture, there's actually, you're right that there was terrible damage in Vietnam. We killed yes. 3 million people. We've lost, we lost 58,000. We damaged their infrastructure and their environment yes. terribly. Yes. And uh, we're going to have to take a quick break. We'll be right back after the break and to continue this Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. Just letting you know where else I broadcast, which is on the AWARE show. And you can also find us on demand on the podcast. Anywhere you listen to your podcast, you can just check out the AWARE show. And we've got some great interviews up there right now. 
some great professionals recently I've interviewed talking about near-death experiences, talking about anxiety and depression, all sorts of great solution-oriented programming. You can check that out there at wherever you listen to your podcast. We will be right back with Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. My guest is Ed Tick, and we're talking about his latest book, which is called Soul Medicine. And he's really describing in this book ancient healing techniques that we might have forgotten in modern medicine that are just as valid and very, very helpful. Um, Ed, I wanted to ask you about the uh, experience that you were talking about in terms of the theatrical uh, grief tragedy theater and not grief, but the tragedy theater that you were experiencing, how does that, by witnessing and seeing all the tragedy, how does it aid in the healing? Is it because of the collective group that you're around? Uh, in part, it's because of the collective group. That mm-hmm. That's part of the answer. All right. So Greek tragedies portrayed the mythic stories, but in very, very moving poetry and, of course, um, transformed by the playwrights, and as we said, the playwrights were combat veterans. So when we are in tragic theater, we are in a communal setting. So yes, the stories are belong to everyone. Mm. We are experiencing our emotions together. We're not uh, in a private psychotherapy office or in our homes, uh, isolated, but we are in a communal setting where we're realizing that everybody carries these stories, and they are collective stories, not individual stories. And on stage, we're seeing uh, the myths that are portrayed are actually representations of our universal healing story, uh, our universal stories. So when we see uh, the gods and goddesses on the, on the stage, uh, we're seeing aspects of ourselves, the divine aspects of ourselves that are being portrayed. When we're seeing... Uh, warriors or survivors of war and conflict and ex- hearing their stories and experiencing it in uh, a complex holistic performance that's uh, written with beautiful poetry that uh, those are our words that we feel these are, it's as if our souls are talking and we're hearing the deepest stories that we carry and the deepest wounds that we share uh, portrayed as uh the, the collective myth that we've all lived. So it's the collective story uh, in a culture that is portraying them, giving expression to the entire uh, culture, not keeping the stories locked up, and showing us in symbolic form the universal stories that we all live, and giving us an intense emotional experience to draw out those um, buried negative emotions that we've been keeping to ourselves and have been making us and they're released in the, the theater experience. What would you say would be the modern-day application of something like that? Maybe uh, well, a funeral? Uh, I'm sorry? Maybe a funeral? It, well, uh, in part, uh, even at funerals, we're too quiet. In At Greek mm-hmm. funerals, uh, people are keening and crying and sharing their emotion loud, uh, loudly and strongly. And in the Greek tradition, uh, they also have uh, what they call mitologia, which are songs written individually for the deceased person singing about their lives and what they're leaving behind. So there's communal grieving, they're sharing stories, and there's creating artwork based on the person's life that um, that celebrates them and lives beyond them. So the uh, much like an Ar- even do their funerals differently, um, like an Irish be, wake type of experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. like an Irish wake. Yes, um, and they're they're a collective and communal and uh, experiential and uh, cathartic experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and a modern, more modern version of, for American culture um, might be uh, the psychodrama. That it's not just going to a play or going to a movie and sitting there quietly and passively, but rather being in a group where people are reenacting the play, identifying with the characters, using the ca- the dramatic performance to tell their story and express their feelings, and demonstrating how the story uh, that 
we're acting is actually our own internal drama that we've lived. So that's much closer to the original uh, theatrical experience than just uh, going to a, a dark theater and sitting there quietly and passively. And definitely don't go through these things alone when you're healing trauma or grief or whatever it is to have that communal experience. I mean, there's support groups and those types of experiences that really can move the energy of something like this. And it is based on these ancient Greek healing rituals that, I mean, the dream incubation existed for some, what, 2,000 years that lasted? It lasted for 2,000 years, yes. Must have worked. <laughs> it worked. We, as uh, we said earlier, we have thousands of stories of uh, ancient cases where extraordinary healings occurred. It did work. Mm. Uh, um, and, and it can still work today. So I've been leading these journeys um, since, well, since 1995. And I have not only experienced some healing myself, as we shared, but I've facilitated and witnessed extraordinary healing uh, from many of the people I've taken, uh, both to uh, Greece and to Vietnam. So, And this brings us to another dimension of my presentation, and that is that pilgrimage itself, leaving our form of culture, which is highly isolated and individualistic, and going into other cultures that are more spiritually based, that are more communal, where people really talk to each other and share and tell their stories and will sit and talk for hours and hours and hours uh, and have many of these holistic practices. Uh, So pilgrimage itself, where we put ourselves, remove ourselves from our mainstream culture and immerse in another culture with different kinds of people, stories, values, and practices uh, is a profound healing experience. Mm. Now, how can people do this on their own? Is there a way that they can bring back this holistic art of making the um, interpretation of dreams a a individual practice? Is there a way or that you teach to do this? I know that you lecture about this, but how can somebody do it on their own? Oh, sure. Uh, There are the, the spiritual practices are also meant to be practical. Yay! Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, good. We have to have to do them, and um, and in this tradition also, uh, we're invited to be our own best doctors. It's not uh, that we only turn ourselves over to the experts. In fact, um, I'm sorry, trying to remember the wonderful case uh, quotes from Hippocrates, but um, oh well. He said, any person who isn't their own doctor is a fool. So yes, yes. one. Yes. Um, and uh, so we really, and that we all have a doctor within us, and we have to help that doctor do his or her work. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so we, yes, we can do this on our own. Uh, and? First, I, I want to say that um, profound healing dreams can come spontaneously. People will have them sometimes, and I've been collecting those. We could tell stories of people who weren't looking for them, but who had breakthrough dreams and visions and uh, non-normative experiences that brought them profound healing. So that's possible. But when we study the, the practices and how they were done, they're actually kind of easy to replicate on our own if we have the devotion. So we can put ourselves, we can be on a pilgrimage even at home. Uh, I okay. Urge, okay. So I urge, yeah, I'd love you to explain how. Sure. I urge people to keep a journal yes. and to really write about and think about what is uh, what are their greatest healing needs, what is bothering them, um, what's afflicting them, and to declare themselves on a search for their healing or their soul's growth. Uh, I urge people to take their dreams very seriously. And lots of people say they can't remember dreams, so they only have little fragments. Mm-hmm. Well, that doesn't matter. Don't rush out of bed in the morning. When you wake up, go slowly, breathe deeply, try to cleanse your mind. Don't think about what you have to do at work in an hour. See what images are still floating in your mind and grab them. 
write them down in your journal. We can even increase our dream memory this way by collecting the fragments slowly over time, and we will dream more, we will remember more. Right now, a person can put themselves in incubation as well. I have something that's emotionally or physically really bothering me. I'm looking for some healing for this. Um, I can incubate myself. I can take a day off. Oh. Uh, I can I can fast. I can pray. I can do my journal work. I can set my intentions, and I can lie in bed. Uh, I can write a note um, to myself or to the divine for what I'm looking for, put it under my pillow, and uh, I can incubate myself and stay in my bed or on my couch in my dream chamber um, for as long as I need until I get some dream or vision or deep insight that can lead me to, to healing myself. So, yes, we can do this. It's, it's great to do it in a group of pilgrims where people are doing it together and supporting each other uh, and where we have a facilitator. But it's not required. We can do this on our own as well. Okay. And we don't have to travel to Greece or Vietnam. To right, do right, do right. You know, I love that we're empowering people to be able to do this on their own because, of course, this was practiced for 2,000 years, and it doesn't have to be done in a specific region. And you're bringing forward these techniques and some of these ancient um, ideas, philosophies to modern times. That's the whole point. Could you share a little bit more about some of the other Greek figures in history and what lessons or wisdom that you might have grain, gained from maybe Dionysus or Apollo or any other mythological Greek figures? Oh, sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, I'm going to start with an actual human being rather than a mythological figure. I'd like to start with Socrates. Okay. Okay, so yes. we've all heard of Socrates, and we know a few of the more famous things he said. Uh, people know that he was uh, put to death for uh, telling the truth. Um, now, Socrates is actually the philosopher who gave us the concept of soul that we have now. Uh, our, in fact, our healing words come from this tradition. Psychology, psychotherapy, psychiatrists all come from the Asclepian healing tradition. Psyche in ancient Greek meant soul. We translate psychology as the science of the mind, but that's not really accurate. Psyche is soul. And logi comes from logos, which is a beautiful word that's hard to translate, but it means something like the order and meaning of the universe. So psychology is the order and meaning of the soul, not just the study of the mind. Now, Socrates taught us what the soul is, um, and the soul is that in us which t tells us what is good uh, and bad, what is right and wrong, and is harmed when we do wrong and grows and deepens when we do good. And uh, the soul is that which we're trying to follow um, to live lives uh, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And Socrates taught, tried to teach the Athenians to stop going after money-making and power, but instead uh, pay attention to your soul, tend the needs of your soul. That's where health and healing come from. And uh, we're still trying to learn those lessons. Um, so that's one figure. Uh, Apollo, uh, and we can look at all the gods and goddesses and what they represented and the gifts that they brought people. But um, they weren't only symbols. These were people experienced them as living powers, as realities that we can, that are concerned with us, that interact with the human uh, in ancient Greece. The divine and the human were very, very close to each other. And people didn't believe that the gods looked like us or that their statues were gods. That's a misinterpretation of paganism. People believed that these were universal powers built into the, the cosmos that, uh, and that the god and goddess figures were representations of those powers. So when they build a, a temple to Apollo or to Athena, they're building something that is so beautiful and so powerful, so perfect, that it's attracting the divine energies there so that we human beings can meet them there. So it's not a humanoid type of figure, 
but rather a representation of the cosmic power that we're giving human form so we can meet it. Um, um, the God and goddess become the intermediary for us to communicate with the universe. And we could go through each one and what they represent. But Apollo was the god of truth uh, and of oracles. And so mm -hmm. but, uh, today we might use uh, the runes or tarot or the I Ching for seeking oracles. Well, in ancient times, people went to Delphi, uh, where Apollo sat and gave oracles. Or there were, as we said, there were over 300 holistic healing sanctuaries all over the Mediterranean world. We also know there were over 200 oracular sites and sanctuaries, like uh, Delphi is the only the most famous one. But people would go on pilgrimage also to go to a site where Apollo or another one of the god powers sat to receive oracles. It wasn't pulling cards is great, and I use the oracles as well. Uh, but imagine traveling overland for many days and going to a sacred sanctuary where we're told that a god or goddess dwells here and is going to give us an oracle directly from the divine. Well, we're going to take those very, very seriously, uh, just like the big dreams that happened in dream incubation. When we take a message that's coming from a divine source, we will pay much more attention to it than mm -hmm. when it comes from human source right we were just talking about oracles the first couple hours of the show and it is so obvious that these it's it's a message that's trying to come through that we can go back to our ancient history and look at how the oracles really looked at tradition and philosophy and prophecy and how we are now actually empowered to be able to follow our own tuition intuition and gain the same type of clarity so we can kind of do this on our own now as long as we understand that and yes and yes. practice it yes yes so that's helping us bring back the intuitive and the imaginal and the associational and the symbolic that balances mm -hmm. uh, our uh, world has become hyper rational and hyper technological mm. those aren't bad but they're out of balance and when we bring back the non-rational intuitive dimensions we put ourselves back in balance and we help heal ourselves, each other, and our society. Yes, and this is all very possible. And it helps to understand the past in order to know how to go forward in the future. And, it, you know, is there technology around any of this, any type of technology that you're aware of around any of this? Well, I would call, and other people, uh, is not my original thought, but we call um, ancient rituals sacred technology. Mm. So, yes, there's technology, <laughs> but uh, it's not the machine kind, but it's the action kind. I mean, we could even say that the ancient dramas were technological in the sense that they had formulas, they had stories, they uh, they had extensive theaters where uh, the, they staged the, the plays. Um, they had huge public um, festivals uh, that involved the entire city-state where people were practicing these rituals together. Yeah. So it's a, a different that, kind of technology. Right, but that you can look at some of the modern-day practical applications of that and realize the benefit, the weight of it, and get just as much out of it. All right, we'll be right back. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast AM. My guest is Ed Tick, and he's the author of Soul Medicine, Healing Through Dream Incubation, visions, oracles, and pilgrimage. And I have a question, and we also have callers that have questions for you, Edison, I want to get to that as well. But can you use any of these ancient healing techniques for moving forward, maybe to create a new, you know, after you've left your job or a new vocation moving forward or some type of healing going forward? Oh, yes. Uh, and these techniques were used that way quite extensively in ancient times, and we can as well. Uh, whenever we have a significant life question, we can use these seagull healing techniques to seek new direction. So we're not only talking about uh, healing our physical or, or our psychological struggles. We're also talking about finding direction for our future. Uh, 
we all have purpose. We all have destinies we want to fulfill. Much of our suffering comes from feeling like we're really not on our true life path. And uh, so many people are unhappy in their work. They find it boring or meaningless or uh, just putting their time in when they really want their lives to contribute something more. And so, yes, we can seek oracles. We can seek Mm. dreams. We can uh, seek visions. We can go on pilgrimage uh, to answer questions about the future, to find out why we're here, what we're meant to do, and to embrace our soul's purpose. Great. Okay, well, that's good to know. Um, Let's go to some callers. We've got our uh, wild card line one. We've got Jojo from Milwaukee. Hi, welcome to Coast to Coast. You have a a question for Edward Tick. Well, more of a in, for one's interest thing. <clears throat> in Go Milwaukee, ahead. there's a group called Crispin, and there's a program, Wisconsin um, Public TV, Wisconsin Life, I would say, slash Crispin uh, dot org, and you can get the segment. A young lady does, you know, segments of things going on in Milwaukee, mm-hmm. I mean, in, in, in Wisconsin. And I was so impressed because the people, uh, you know, persons such as uh, the speaker tonight, and um, they are facilitating uh, people with post-traumatic stress trauma, like, you know, Vietnam, vet, the veterans mm-hmm. and whatever. And they are emoting through Shakespeare. They'll have a a segment of Shakespeare, ah. and then each person responds in their own emotional way. Good and to know. I'm so impressed with it. So I'd like the listeners to know that they can, you know, get on their computers, Wisconsin Life, I would say slash Crispin, C R I S P I N, I believe. I need to get, I don't have, I'm 80 years young. I need to get computers. So. Mm-hmm. No, that's okay. Thanks uh, for the information. I appreciate but, but that. That's basically what I was going to share. Great. Thank you so much. Are you familiar with any of that, Ed? Yes. Uh, Thank you for that call, and that's very, very helpful. Um, The organization Crispin probably comes from Shakespeare's play Henry V and the the famous Mm -hmm. St. Crispin Day speech. Uh, Yes, uh, I use that also. We can use Shakespeare and any other good drama as well as ancient tragedy, Um, and uh, there's, uh, yes, so Shakespeare is being used for helping veterans heal from PTSD. And the ancient tragedies, too. There's an a organization called Theater of War that's been traveling around the country uh, giving performances of the ancient theaters to veteran groups and actually on some of our military bases as well. And veterans hear and feel themselves just like our listeners shared. So, uh I, one veteran I work with who became an actor for his mm. healing um, memorized and gives the St. Crispin Day speech uh, at many of our veteran healing retreats. So giving using poetry from the ages to give voice to that which is going in, uh, on in ourselves is really important. Uh, it's part of the function of art. And the the program, the Crispin program, and others like it around the country are very, very helpful. That is great to know. So it exists, and it's it's getting stronger. A great movement. Um, all right. So let's see if we have Cynthia in. She is in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Maybe close to you. Hi. Hi, Hi Cynthia. Hi, Ed. Um, I am a person with many disabilities. I do have post-traumatic stress disorder, but um, I have cured that by my poetry writing. I do poetry writing, and uh, basically I have, um, I know you're not a medical doctor. It's like you were saying about a dream state. I have pins and needles in my hands and my feet. One of my hands is got free of the pins and needles. But how can we, uh, is it visualization through the dream state that we can try to eliminate uh, the condition, or how do we maneuver that? Great question. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, I'm sorry you're suffering, and those are really good questions. So, yes, keep writing poetry, for sure. That's one way. And I don't know how you, uh, your form of writing, but you can write from the disability conditions as well. You can um, 
allow the poem you're writing to be the pins and needles that are in your hands or your feet and let them talk. Uh, turn the poetic voice over to any of our symptoms and let them let the affliction in our bodies or in our souls express itself through poetry. So that's one. A second matter that you brought up is very important, and that is the use of imagery. And so, yes, you're right about that as well. Uh, our symptoms are images that are planted in our bodies that our minds and our hearts and our souls are giving us. So we can, whether it's through poetry or active imagination visualizations, when we take the symptom as an image and don't take it as a fixed condition that we're going to be with forever, but rather move it, let the images move. So in a dream state or in meditation or in guided imagery or active imagination, work with the images that you've been given that are your affliction, but help them move forward. Ask them to talk to you. Ask them to come out through your poetry. Uh, allow yourself to see them in your meditations and see how the imagery is changing and moving because images are the language of the soul. And when we let the, in, the deep imagery change within us, that will give messages over time to our bodies and our minds to act uh, differently and to uh, facilitate healing. Great. Thank you so much for that. And I also know that you, Ed, ha are also a poet. I noticed that your foreword was written by Mark Nepo, who yes. is um, is a friend and a, has interviewed him many times. And you share that poetry gift together, yes? Yes. Uh, Mark and I, uh, we met in college way back mm. in the 60s. Oh, wow. And we were... We were involved together as young poets um, and idealists um, trying to write together, bring poetry into the world, and shared many, many uh, poetry workshops together as we were learning our craft. So Mark is a wonderful philosopher and poet and dear friend, and I'm grateful for his, his forward, and we've stayed in touch and supported each other's work. Uh, and Mark, too, as you know, as he's quite open about it, has had profound healing of his own cancer, and that transformed his life and brought much of his philosophy and poetry to us. So Mark is another person who can talk about the use of the arts and spiritual practices to bring profound healing. Right, he is, and went through that journey. I remember him going through the cancer journey and is on the other side of that now, which... Yes. Yes. It's... It's it, wonderful to bring these techniques back to the modern medicine concepts. Are you speaking with hospitals or any other types of organizations that can make this more of a practice that gets into modern medicine? Well, first I'll share a, a great dream and fantasy I had, and that is that some of our mainstream healthcare institutions would broaden uh, and deepen so much such that they could uh, actually uh, introduce and use dream incubation and other of these practices. So we have some holistic practices that have made it into um, the medical world. So there are theater performances sometimes, as we shared, mm -hmm. theater of war is traveling around and giving those kinds of readings. There are, there's occupational therapy, there's some art therapy. So we have some of the practices, but they're seen as ancillary rather than central. Um, I have uh, I taught in um, medical schools and some of our uh, in the War College and uh, in our um, facilities for educating our our troops and our warriors. And um, I'm happy to say that there's a lot of curiosity and interest. I'm sad to say that no large institution has adopted this yet, yet. Uh, mm. as a modern healing technique. Right. However, many of our holistic healing sanctuaries do have these kinds of practices. So one of my colleagues, for example, who is a holistic psychiatrist, is building a healing sanctuary now In as we speak. She's building one in Belize where dream incubation will be a central practice. Mm. Uh, so the various holistic modes
modalities with dream incubation as the central practice. Um, so uh, that's happening. In Belize. Um, that's wonderful. Yep, that, yeah. An American doctor who's building this this center in Belize. There are some others. There's, there are a few dream sanctuaries um, in Spain mm-hmm. and in Italy. Uh, as I, I travel to Greece, and, and uh, there are many Greek practitioners now who are beginning to use their own ancient practices. So there are people using uh, sacred theater, not just ordinary performance theater, but therapeutic use of theater. Uh, there are people, um, the religion of the 12 Olympians, the original the gods and goddesses we all uh, study in school, uh, that has been, um, well, recent law has made that a, a, a legalized modern religion in Greece. So some people are doing firewalking ceremonies mm. and other sacred rituals under the guidance of the ancient gods and goddesses. Uh, and there are some healing sanctuaries in Greece that are using some of these practices as well. So uh, it's still, it's not mainstream, but it could be. Uh, I do lecture in medical schools. and uh, Oh, great. Uh, yeah, and the, the physicians in training, the medical students often say, wow, dreams, we want to learn how to work with dreams in our medical practice. And right. unfortunately, they're often told, we don't have time. We can't deal with unscientific material. This hasn't been studied enough. Uh, there isn't time in the curriculum or in your medical practice to listen to people that deeply. So that's really something that we all need to change together. Uh, to ask your physician uh, when you have your five minutes with them mm-hmm. to look at you and talk to you and hear your full story, not just to type your data into the computer. Right. Uh, we're, we're the consumers, and we're so, this is supposed to be we're supposed to be in a system uh, where a uh, patient is the center of the care. So we have the right to expect our uh, medical practitioners and our psychiatric practitioners to give us more time and listen to us better. So uh, yes. we can be, uh, demand a little of that as consumers. Yes, definitely. Um, let's go to our, we have time for one more caller in just a few minutes here, Joe from Long Island. Hi, Joe. How you doing tonight? Yeah, hi. I have two-part question. One is, you know, bridging the gap and making some of this less formidable and then, you know, even if you're in a shaky situation, you know, you strike out four times in a baseball game, but you do hit a home run, maybe draw out the positive and think about the positive. So how do you be positive in the difficult times using what you're talking about? And, and... Well, yeah, that that's a wonderful question, Joe. And uh, one simple technique, it's not so simple to do it, but if we practice it, it really works, is when we're in difficult and stressful times, as we all are today, to also remember what we're grateful for, what's positive in our lives. Uh, I can wake up in a bad mood, and I don't want to go to work that day, and I don't want to have to face my uh, problems or other people's problems, but I feed the birds, and I watch the sunrise. And I think about what is good and positive in my life. And I say um, some uh, prayers or statements of gratitude about those things. It breaks the addictive um, dimension of negative thinking that can take over our minds and that really oppress us today. We all wake up um, being traumatized every day by the awful news that we get. And this is not about politics. This is about so much breakdown in the, the global system, climate change, uh, the violence in our society. So we're all overly stressed. We all have a degree of post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm-hmm. It's collective, and we have to uh, use the arts, listen to each other's stories, and uh, look at what is positive and break the um, terrible addictive hold of the negativity that's in all of our lives. Yeah, the devastation and fatality. Yes, it definitely exists, and it does require a small sliver of hope in order to move us forward, I believe. And if we can continue to offer that information along with the awareness of the injustices in the world, but offering that sliver of hope 
expands into the possibilities of where we can go moving forward. And I'm a big proponent of that. And yes, there is, we definitely can do better and we must do better as a society. And we need some models and examples of how that's going to work as well. Well, you have been just wonderful to talk with. And there's a lot more that you can find out of, of other books that Edward Tick has done. And it's Edward Tick, T I C K dot com. That's on your website, as well as this book and many others. And great. And you are a professor at uh, what university? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm independent. Oh. Thank you. Oh. I guest lecture at many universities across the country and around the world, but I have stayed independent in order to pursue uh, this kind of work um, as, uh, as, as urgently as I possibly can. Okay. That's a great choice. An independent educator rather than uh, an established tenured professor somewhere. Uh Uh-huh. I think that's a great choice. And you can get information more readily available to more universities and not be beholden to a specific uh, standard curriculum for a long period of time. Uh, Yes. And honestly, uh, I'm free to research and write and study what I want rather than having to do it in a straight and narrow tenure track Mm -hmm. manner. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I can also write poetry. <laughs> Lots of ground, but yes, you can also do what you love. Well, thank you again for all your contributions and the reminders here of how to bring our souls back into medicine. And I want to say thank you to all of the Coast to Coast family here. Thank you so much, Lisa Lyon and George Nori, Tommy Dan Heiser, Gina Salvati here, and Michael Casio, who's in studio with me, and Stephanie Smith, Chris Foros. Thank you all for for all the work you do. And thank you so much for being a Coast listener and part of the Coast family here. Your energy makes these shows happen every single night. I'm Lisa Gar. Until next time, I invite you to stay aware.